now reconvene to open session. The board would like to remind the public that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. It is also available via live stream for the public through links found on the front page of the RUSD website. We would also like to remind everyone to please enter and exit through the lobby. Tonight, we have Sophie Burns from Rockland High as our student board representative. Sophie, will you please introduce the color guard and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of the colors by the Rockland Unified School District's Junior ROTC Color Guard and the Pledge of Allegiance. The commander and U.S. flag bearer for this evening's Color Guard is Cadet Captain Ryan Manning. The state flag is carried by Cadet Captain Sophia Burkhalter. The right guard is Cadet Master Sergeant Madison Card. The left guard is Cadet Captain McKenna McVicker. Thank you. Okay, we will now move to our special recognition and presentations portion of the evening. Chief Dosange, will you please introduce our family partners in education recognition tonight? Good evening, President Sadoff, trustees and superintendent stock. The family partners in education program allows the Rockland Unified School District to recognize family engagement and involvement to help our students achieve excellence during the school year. Antelope Creek Elementary School Principal Brian Arcuri is introducing the Verner family for tonight's Family Partners in ed Education Recognition. Well, help me out here. Good evening, President Sadhoff, Board, uh, Superintendent Stock. What an honor to be here on this beautiful spring day. And you can see I have this beautiful family here and we're here to honor their contribution to Antelope Creek, um, specifically Ms. Varner here, who is our current PTC president and has been on the board for how many years? Five, three? Your husband says five. I'm going with your husband. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna give you a couple extra credit years. But here's a fun fact too, you were in your, the, Kindergarten, went to kindergarten at Antelope Creek and is now returning as a parent of these two fine. Where did Charlotte go? <laughs> oh, Charlotte. But we're recognizing them tonight, and Samantha, for all her contributions. And it always humbles me when I start talking about this. It brings me to tears, truthfully, because it's done, they have these, they have day jobs, and yet they come and they give nothing but time and effort and energy to our school. And how humbling and inspiring, so thank you. So some recent things they've done. She's led us and we just replaced our whole kindergarten rug in the library, our, our rug in the library, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it was great. Kids go in there now and they have a place to sit that's vibrant and clean and nice, you know? Um, she also just led an effort where the PTC funded a new electronic marquee for Antelope Creek, which is going to be fabulous, because then I don't have to get up on a ladder every month. <laughs> so I really thank you for that one. Um, what else? I mean, I could go on and on. Funnel hoops on the main yard, refurbishing the kindergarten yard. Um, what else? Class and school supplies, honoring our staff monthly giving back just unselfishly. So I wanna honor your mom tonight. I wanna honor you guys, because again, Charlotte and Jackson and Alan, her husband, also are always at these events and fundraisers, giving their time, helping out when they can too. And they have to give up mom, you know, uh, on certain nights. So that's big, right, to be without mom for a couple hours. So. We honor her tonight. Samantha, thank you for everything you've done for Antelope Creek. Thank 
Samantha, it is my pleasure to give you this award, and there's a gift also. Um, so I know that parents like you do the work of 10 parents, and that often it's the few that does the work for the many. And if it wasn't for parents like you, they just wouldn't get done. So I know that the teachers appreciate you so much, and the parents of the rest of the school are very lucky to have you and very grateful that you do all that you do. Thank you. Always fun seeing these presentations. It's such an important part of the night. Chief Desange, will you please go on to our next item, our uh, employee recognition for the evening. President Sadoff, trustees and superintendent stock. Tonight for our employee recognition, Victory High School principal Scott Hutton joins us to introduce Alicia Walker. Good evening, President uh, Satoff, excuse me, Trustee Superintendent Stock. It's, it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, if you don't know, this is Alicia Walker, one of my dear friends and colleagues, and probably the most energetic and positive person on the planet. No exaggeration here. Uh, <laughs> they know, they know. If you ever contacted our campus by phone, you know that every call is answered with the most welcome and jovial good morning. If you've ever visited our campus, you know that every personal greeting is done with a warm smile and a contagious hello, <laughs> how are you, and certainly the kindness that goes with it. And quite honestly, if you haven't had the pleasure of either of those, then holy buckets, I think that your life is about to be fulfilled just a little bit more because I'm going to go on for a little <laughs> while, so bear with me. Alicia joined the Rockland Unified School District in 2011, working in the Nutrition Services Department. Uh, later that same year, she transferred to the Rockland Alternative Education Center where she started as our librarian. Like all that Alicia does, she, has an, she was an exceptional librarian. But I always know for the reasons that I already stated, we needed to find a place for her where she had more of a public interactive role. So in 2020, when our current registrar had retired, Alicia accepted that current position. And I will tell you that she has been exceptional in every facet of that role. And to be clear, the position of site registrar and, her, and attendance clerk, and she does both is a daunting responsibility, particularly at an alternative education center. However, Alicia has dedicated the time to fully understand the complexities of our programs and takes extra care to present that information to families interested in enrolling. And this is where it's really important because she takes the time, and I hear her all the time, providing the, the positive promotion that we need and explaining the different by design that our program has to offer. Further, she spends an extraordinary amount of time reminding families why they need to be at school, what happens if they aren't at school, calling and emailing them to remind them that they aren't in school, <laughs> assisting former graduates who actually were at school and that's why they graduated. Gone through. Mm -hmm, that's exactly right. Providing graduation documentation, answering the phone, maintaining records, responding to record requests, providing first aid assistance, and announcing one of my favorites and that is our Panther Pride recipients. Despite the enormity of these tasks, and I'm certain that I am missing a whole bunch of them, she goes beyond her assigned responsibilities to provide support and goodwill for our entire team here. And this is almost everybody. As a self-proclaimed foodie, she is the unofficial office chef, <laughs> filling the office with tempting smells and offering the appetizer samples throughout the day. As the Sunshine Club coordinator, and this is kind of my favorite part, to be honest, she takes the time to decorate the spaces. You should have seen my office on my birthday. Holy buckets, it was crazy. It was a giant floor for me. Yeah, it was beautiful. 
but also she's coordinated the treats that go along with it to ensure every birthday is special, but also when personal circumstances arise that those are recognized as well. Often serving as the face of our school, Alicia's character, values, and personality, they epitomize the culture that we work daily to foster in our school. Despite the, the very frequent difficult conversation her position requires, whether with students or parents, she consistently maintains a positive, compassionate, and sympathetic disposition, Recogn recognizing excuse me, that our, our students often carry more weight than they should, quite honestly. She sees the positives in each one of them and goes beyond to help them reach their potential. Not only does she know every student by name, but she also knows their parents by name. And if I was a betting person, I'd say she probably knows their grandparents <laughs> by name. It's pretty awesome. Her daughter, Savannah, who is here tonight, you can probably tell that she takes after her, Alicia in many ways, particularly looks, <laughs> but also all of this, the same great character traits. She is an outstanding student at Victory High School. She is also an acclaimed, um, what's, what do we call that? What kind of dancer? dancer? Competitive dancer. That's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. <laughs> so tonight, for all that Alicia does to support Victory High School, the Rockland Alternative Education Center, and quite honestly, the Rockland Unified, the community, she is most deserving of this distinction, so I thank you for that time tonight. Now, Alicia, okay, I get to say a few words, so you got to come up here, although I don't know. Are you worried about what I'm going to say? <laughs> uh, Alicia, when I saw your name come through, oh, I was just so ecstatic. I almost was shocked to say, how have we not done this before? Because you have been here so long and you have made such an incredible impact. And when I saw that you were getting this and only one of us gets to speak, I knew I had to fight to be able to say a few words because Alicia, I have known you for many years and you have served our community in such incredible ways, not only here in the school district, but out in the community. It is amazing to see the group that is here tonight. It shows the way that you love and that you care. I've encountered you not only as a trustee, being able to come and take tours and check in, and each and every time, there is always the joy that we see right now. Every single time I come onto campus, I've seen that. Um, but also as a parent uh, of a child that found themselves wanting a, a different experience with Alternative Center. And so I just think the way that you give hope to every single family, I think he said it best when he said that you know every single parent's name, every single child's name, that's no easy task, um, but that's huge because it lets them know that, that you see them, you care about them. Uh, there's a genuine joy that you bring. There's a genuine hope that you bring. Um, I know that uh, Victory and Rockland Alternative Education Center, you guys do so many different outreaches uh, for your students. Uh, and every single time I've had just a small level of participation, those you've been there on the front lines leading every step of the way. And so I just want to take a second to publicly say thank you. Uh, and again, the people in the room, this is a testament to your character, to your genuine love for the students and their families and the staff. I thought that was so special. Now, I have not seen these treats. You guys did not take me into the back room for the staff treats. So now that I know, I need to take the full tour, apparently. Um, but all joking aside, Alicia, thank you. Thank you for serving not only the community as a whole, but Rockland Unified and specifically the students. Some of, honestly, our most vulnerable students. That, that phone call you make to check on them, that, that could be one of the most critical points of contact they have that entire day or entire week. So thank you for doing that, Alicia. We appreciate you.
We'd like to take a moment to thank you and your families for joining us. While you are more than welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, the, we also know you have busy lives and we want to be respectful of your time. If you would like, you are free to go and enjoy the rest of your evening. It is fully appropriate to sneak out at this point. <laughs> thank you again for joining us. Okay, before we move on with our meeting, Trustee Counter, could you please read action that was taken in closed session this evening? Sure. In closed session, the board voted to release one classified employee from their position pursuant to Education Code 45113. The vote was unanimous. In closed session, the board voted to approve, to approve D. Torrington as the Assistant Director, Special Education and Support Programs. The vote was unanimous. Thank you. Okay, we will now continue on with our meeting with item 6.1, uh, Rockland Teachers Professional Association. I'd like to welcome Travis Majette for our RTPA report. It always feels like we have all this celebration and then there's us. <laughs> so, in a good way, in a good way. Um, for those of you that don't know, Dee was a former bargaining chair for RTPA for a lot of years. Pretty much authored the like standard of special education contract language for not just us, but like for a state model too. So could not be uh, happier to hear her moving into that role. Awesome. Thank you, everybody that was involved. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> um, so I want to start off with uh, with some like opportunities that come up. I'm gonna I'm gonna put my teacher hat on for a minute. First off, good evening, everybody. Hello. Um, so I teach geography on the, the occasional days that I get to be at school and, and do my, my teaching job. Um, and I, I was kind of joking a little bit earlier with, uh, with Tony about such a good year to be a geography teacher in Rockland because we have like real geography things happening right here in Rockland that from, a, from an adult perspective and, and no, um, no surprise, but from a board member's perspective, with uh, the remapping of our district right now is angst filling and there's a little bit of, of anxiety around that. But what an opportunity to remind kids why maps matter and how important this class that I take just because I have to graduate might actually be when it comes to the real world. So um, just a great opportunity to kind of bring that real world stuff, real world stuff in. Um, I want to give a shout out and He's only with us through this process, but Dr. Levitt and the way he has built and presented things for the public to look at and understand is, I, I've never been a part of this process or really paid a lot of attention to something like this, but talk about making it accessible to the community. There's a lot of information on there, and if you go in and a community, if you're listening, go in and look at the maps and the spreadsheets that go with them because it's totally layman's and, and palatable and understandable. And, and there's the why with, it's not just the here's the thing, but there's a why if you just take even just a few minutes to look at that. So I'm just gonna speak to that later. And I'm not an expert by any means, but just really appreciative of that process being one that the community that it's gonna affect and involve can actually understand it. And then from a selfish perspective, a geography teacher can bring it into a, a conversation in a classroom. Um, I have that as a geography teacher. And then I mean, kind of the, the other side of, of uh, the, the, not just the literal world, but Geography in real life, we have a lot of conflict going on in Eastern Europe and Middle East, and we teach those units and have for a long time in geography at Whitney High School. And again, it's an unfortunate situation, but it's, it's a neat time to be teaching that content. And then, oh, by the way, the stuff we taught you, that was history that happened many years ago. Like, let's turn on the news right now. We can see it like real life today, right? And again, it's an unfortunate reality of those situations, but Again, just a great opportunity to be an educator in, in that content area. I get to be a little bit selfish with that. So um, government at work and, and geography at work. And again, good year to be a geography teacher. So on the, the occasional days that I get to do that. I um, really want to kind of focus my time tonight on the, the RTPA side, um, just on the labor work. First, want to acknowledge um, President Sadoff. We're playing email tag, and I know we got some things, but I really appreciate you reaching out after my comments last meeting 
Um, and for those that don't know, we're working on getting time together to work on some of those collaborative conversations that I was discussing with you guys last time. So I'm really appreciative of that. It sounds like we're gonna finally get that opportunity next week. So I just saw your email when I got here, but really appreciative of that. Of that. Um, also of our, um, it's a limited capacity, but we have two trustees that get to join us in our labor work. And we had some, some pullout days last week. And so I know um, Trustee Hupp and Trustee Price got to join us for the, the first part of kind of our day one. They sit at that steering level um, group with us. And it was great conversation at that group um, to have a task of where are we going with this, right? We kind of knew why we needed it, but we're past the need. And now we're at a place with our labor work of where are we going? And it was really fun to hear the conversations um, with, both with our board members there and then as the day evolved as well. Um, with the expanded in different groups of, there's a, a strong interest to have a, a common goals, obviously, um, but we, I, it was a great opportunity for us to use the LCAP as kind of an anchor or a starting point for that labor work to transition from relational to teaching and learning, right? The whole job that we're actually all here to do. Um, so it was really cool to see that shift in focus um, and it, it was well-timed. I know we have a, an LCAP update this evening, um, but to have something that has always been a collaborative process just by nature of, of requirements of the LCAP, but to see that be something that we can all lock in on and then find ways to better collaborate, understand, and implement those LCAP priorities, right? As well as things that aren't a priority but are still part of that process. So it was really cool, and that's really kind of the big focus of that day one. So. Um, for those of you that aren't um, kind of in the loop of the, the labor collaboration work, um, we have a steering level group that kind of drives big district level things. We've expanded that out to have intentional relationships through different departments and different leadership, both in RTPA, district, and where we even got to conversations of who else can we start bringing to this room and what other groups and, and partnerships can we start building. Um, and then, um, and then we, we ended the day actually with a, a kind of a neat opportunity of RTPA's small leadership group and Rockland Unified's small leadership group, just kind of where, where are we struggling in areas? And it was, it was, it was good to hear um, in a constructive way that like we got work of our own to do, right? We put a lot of time and intentional efforts into those below and around the organization, but there's areas where we need to step back. And I, I love the term Roger always uses is just recalibrate, right? Where can we as leaders refocus ourselves? Where do we need to work on things? And then hopefully that becomes new culture and new norm in other areas um, around all of us. So it was just a really cool day. Day two was probably my favorite though. No offense to everybody that was at day one, but day two is uh, this time was our site, our site kind of level focus. So we brought all of our site reps um, teams, we brought our principals, um, and we even at the high school level, we were able to, to fold in an assistant principal, so we were able to kind of grow that group a little bit there as well. Um, my favorite part of the day was um, the work was very organic and very intentional, but with like no boundaries other than like, hey, here's your lane and here's my lane, but we've got like five lanes of play space in the middle. Um, we, got, we got to see opportunities of collaboration happening from like, we need help, help guide and, and kind of hold our hand in this journey to like, we got this and uh, I actually got an update from my own site today and, and I'm not officially part of that labor team, but I'm indirectly there. Um, and they had a great offsite work day, just kind of really celebrating the accomplishments that they were able to do, right? They're in a different place um, as all the sites are where they were really kind of able to sit back and just look at the successes and not just look at where do we need to work next, but let's just enjoy the moment, right? And the good that we've already done and, and kind of grow from there. Um, but again, my, my favorite part of the day was a new element we folded in where we added some layers of consultation, some close intentional conversations. Um, we leaned into our labor leaders um, that, that come and partner with us and they, they were able to partner with some site teams and do some work there. And then Roger and I got to go sit in a room. Now I'll, I'll remind you guys, there are conference rooms in this building that have zero ventilation. So if you get a choice, don't pick those conference rooms. But um, we sweated through it, and, uh, and we had just some overwhelmingly positive conversations with sites. And it wasn't that everybody came in there and sang praises. It was that everybody came in there and had a level of trust and comfort and safety where they could look the superintendent in the eye, they could look the union president in the eye, and tell us where do they need help, and how can we need help, or how can we help them. Um, and they came in there with realistic expectations, right? Nobody came in with a, we need to start from square one and level everything and, and redo it. They came in with, these are some challenges. These are some ideas we have to overcome these challenges. How can you help, right? And if nothing else, people felt heard, and it, right? If you know anything about collaboration, sometimes that's all that's needed for people to be able to move and work together. 
but it was the commitment of Superintendent Stock to sit there with me, and then a huge kudos to all the teams that did get a chance. We didn't get a chance to meet with everybody, just time constraints, but the teams that came in the room had no problem communicating very directly what they needed, and also kind of what they don't need, right? Things that they're doing well, areas where they're looking for some additional help, and that to me is the exact definition of collaboration, right? We're here, we're not here to just have the, the easy, fun conversations, we're gonna have difficult, uncomfortable, or just eye-opening ones, and everybody walked out of the room with a like, oh my gosh, like, I think we know where to go next, right? Whether we can plug some resources in and solve problems, or we have to step back and reevaluate on a bigger level. So it was just, it was such a fun experience. Um, Superintendent Stock and I are also talking about like, how can we make that more of a, a regularly accessible opportunity? Um, and we've had some staffs reach out in the past, say, can you come to a staff meeting and touch on this topic? This might be another opportunity for us to get out and do that together, right? That collaborative joint effort. Um, so it was, just, it was just really good. There was a lot of other stuff going on in the room. We were just kind of, like I said, locked in there. Um, with lots of good conversation, so it was really fun. Again, just kudos to Roger for, for putting himself out there. That's not a comfortable or regular thing for a superintendent to do in a lot of areas, and it just speaks to, to the superintendent we have, and then again, just all the work that everybody's been, been a part of through that. So um, the, the fun thing that came out of that is, is the homework side of it, and I'm not really a big homework teacher, but I love that we left those two days with homework of how can we make this a teaching and learning focus process now? Right? We started this with a we need to help fix and repair relationships and just communication and those kind of basic things. And we're, we're what seems like way down the road, but also just yesterday, we're now in a place where um, we're talking about how does this implement in a classroom? How does this directly connect kids, not just staff members that indirectly connect the kids, right? So it's just really cool um, to kind of be that place already when it feels like we just started this work. And at the same time, it feels like we've been doing it forever. So just kind of one of those neat nuances that develop through things. So I did, again, just huge shout out. I know there's continued support from the board to be able to do those things. You guys authorize and allow resources and time for those things. It's very appreciated. Um, again, I'm hoping that, that uh, once uh, President Sadoff and I get an opportunity to sit down, we can kind of continue some conversations and we'll just keep kind of that, that ball rolling um, as we go into it. I mean, we're in that spring sprint now, is what I like to call it, whether you're running away from allergies, you're running to graduation, or you're running to not go to summer school if you're a high school student listening to Mr. Mojet tonight, do your homework. Um, but, uh, but just what a great place to be as the weather changed and the positivity, that kind of energy that comes with that. So again, um, huge shout out to all the people that were involved in the collaborative work. And there's a lot I'm not mentioning. I'm, that just, I don't want to be up here all night, but, uh, but again, just a, a great experience last week and a, just a fun opportunity to just sit and have conversations. Sometimes that's a simple thing like that it make, kind of makes all the difference. So that's all I have for you guys this evening. Um, I'm going to go back and sit and be the other person in the room with you. So thank you. Thank you, Travis. I appreciate the conversation and the update on the labor management work. Uh, I know those are two very full days, so thank you for the update for those of us that can't all sit on that since we're only allowed to have two board members on that. And I do, too, look forward to us meeting uh, next Wednesday, so thank you very much. Uh, moving on to our next item, uh, actually uh, tonight uh, we do not have a report from CSEA, although we're incredibly thankful for their work, so we will continue uh, moving on to item 7.1, comments and report from student board representative, correct? Okay, student board representative Sophie Burns, will you please share your report for the evening? Good evening, trustees and superintendent Stock. Here are a few updates from our schools. Cobblestone was so excited recently to have two amazing employees honored by the district. Dave Mazan was honored as District Paraprofessional of the Year and Brittany Luttrell as District Counselor of the Year. Over 350 students received perfect, excellent, or improved attendance certificates at the end of the second trimester. Student leadership continues to support students with practicing character traits with monthly assemblies and is currently working with Whitney High School leadership to raise funds for the Leukemia Society. PTC has scheduled a family dance on April 12th and campus beautification projects on April 20th. Go Cougars! Whitney High School is getting ready for multicultural week starting on the 22nd. This culminates in Culture Fest on the 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. Also coming up are Junior Prom on Saturday the 20th and Senior Ball on May 4th. Sunset Ranch has been having lots of fun as their Spring Book Fair and first annual PTC International Fair was a huge hit. So many of their families participated and shared their cultures. Such an amazing learning opportunity for students to learn about others. This week, they had a PTC 
PTC sponsored skate night at Skate Town. It was a glowing night. They are also gearing up for Earth Day with the help of their own culture crew and leaders of the pack, student leadership, with a special week full of activities and spirit for campus during the week of April 22nd. They are going green there at the ranch. At Breen, second grade is performing Rumpus in the Rainforest on April 17th and 18th in an evening performance for parents on April 18th. They have been practicing very hard and look forward to performing on stage. Their third graders have been studying the fascinating history of Rockland. They visited the Rockland History Museum last month. Last week, they traveled back in time to the 1890s with a visit to the Bernhard Museum for Living History Day. Their students spent the day doing chores as children did in the 1890s. This is a day their students and parents will never forget. At Parker Whitney, they held their annual talent show with many students displaying their musical, athletic, and dance skills. They also had a surprise staff dance number. Their site also had a food drive for their local high school students who are food insecure. They are looking forward to their book fair next week and their annual root beer float night with the Panther community. Cory Trail students have attended field trips to Coloma for the Gold Discovery Tour, the State Capitol, and the Roseville Theater. These field trips are opportunities for the students to enjoy hands-on learning experiences. This week, Cory Trail has honored the volunteers who have helped them all year to make the school a great place. They had a morning reception honoring families and community helpers. On April 19th, the Cory Trail PTC will be hosting the Spring Carnival. The theme is the World Fair. There will be culturally inspired games for the students to play and food trucks that will provide different ethnic foods. Cory Trail will kick off its Spring Book Fair on April 19th along with the Spring Carnival and will open until the 25th. It's going to be a couple of weeks filled with fun and excitement at Twin Oaks Elementary. Snowy King will be at Twin Oaks every other Wednesday, just in time for the warmer weather. The PTC is hosting their Spring Festival on Friday, April 19th from 5 to 7 p.m. They are grateful for the support of high school volunteers from Rockland and Whitney High School, who will make this event even more special. Their talented third grade Timberwolves are practicing for their upcoming play, Going Buggy, which will be presented next Friday the 26th. Next Friday is also Spirit Day. Staff and students are invited to dress up as their favorite book characters. They are all looking forward to the next few weeks and know that they will have additional events before wrapping up this school year. Rockland Elementary just wrapped up a successful Bingo and Book Fair family night last Friday. In addition, Bulldog Country continues to offer after-school clubs for students. This spring, they're offering wall ball, pickleball, disc golf, kindness, book, and volleyball clubs. There's something for everyone. Sierra Elementary wants to thank the PTC for their support of the school dance show, Dance is Joy, a celebration of cultural dances from around the world, directed by International Dance Art Academy. Through a collaborative partnership with Sierra's VAPA and PE programs and several Sierra parent volunteers who provide their cultural expertise and resources to enhance this program. During the dance show, Sierra students had the opportunity to practice their IB learner profile attribute risk-taking by performing in front of an audience of peers and supporters. We are very proud of them all. Sierra's PTC also led a successful and fun school auction at Whitney Oaks Country Club to fundraise to support staffing for Sierra's Spanish classes required by the IB program and many other program enhancements at the school. The Sierra staff is incredibly grateful for the hard work and support of their amazing parent volunteers so that Sierra students can learn a second language and develop the IB approaches to learning intending to launch them into the world as internationally minded students. Lastly, Rockland High School just wrapped up Sadie's Week with many fun lunchtime activities such as a movie and popcorn and large gym and wrapped up the week with a very spirited rally and a great dance. Now Rockland is preparing for their senior prom next Saturday. Thank you, Sophie, for your report. Okay, board, trustees, any colleagues have any items to share with the community? I'll go. So, um, again, had a, had a great event. Just want to comment. So we had the third annual Crystal Apples Award, a Crystal Apple, sorry, not Apples, Apple Award Night um, on Sunday right across the street. And just want to say congratulations to Jennifer Gamble from Victory High School. Uh, congratulations to Ryan Spears, Jerrica Siska, and Bill Kimmel from Rockland High School. And congratulations to Whitney Lum, Abby Pena, and Emily Cavolt from Whitney High School. So they all were uh, Crystal Apple Award winners on that night. It was very good. Thank you. And then a sincere thank you to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is right across the way that hosted this whole thing, put it together, and it was an amazing opportunity to honor and appreciate the teachers. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and congratulations to the winners.
Uh, appreciate what you said, um, Travis, about labor management. Um, you know, we were only there for two hours, but um, appreciate that relationship and how things are going. I'm glad to hear about the other, the rest of the two days. Um, on the day after our last board meeting, we loaded the new electric bus and did the prize patrol in the pouring rain, um, but it was really fun. And I don't know that we've had a chance to give those teachers and classified staff a public shout out, so I'm gonna read their names if we haven't had a chance, okay. Um, I'm not, I don't wanna steal anybody else's thunder, but um, Whitney High School Teacher of the Year, Timothy Farnan, Breen, Teacher of the Year for Elementary Schools was um, Ms. Spainhauer, uh, Transportation Department, Christina Maddox, Valley View Elementary, Yvonne Tibbetts, Whitney High School Custodial and Maintenance Services, Eric Schmidt, Victory High School and Rockland High School Food and Nutrition Services, Rosa Sanchez, Cobblestone Paraprofessional, Dave Mazone, Maintenance and Operations, Ralph Ruiz, District Office Technical Services, Jason, um, let's see, Schmeyers, Whitney High School Clerical and Administrative Services, Carrie Schlentz, Cobblestone School Counselor, Brittany Luttrell, and Rockland High School Security Services, Karen Cox. So it was a lot of fun, uh, show up and, and definitely surprise them. Um, it was, yeah, one of the highlights of the year. That's a fun one. Also, at the last music meeting, I um, was again reminded about an amazing teacher, and I just wanted to mention her, Mrs. Thorndike at Rockland Elementary. She's a kindergarten teacher. She, uh, in the last few years, taught herself how to play the ukulele and has brought that into her classroom and is doing some amazing things. I'm, I'm headed to play that with them in the morning tomorrow, but... She also is asked to sit on the nonprofit Ukes for School as on their board as a teacher representative, and they also donated 12 ukuleles to the Rockland Elementary staff who want to start playing. So I'm really impressed with her and excited to engage with her and see what else we can do to support her. Last thing, uh, Rockland City Day of Service is on Saturday. We have big projects happening for the city as well as for the school district. Uh, if you'd like to join us on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. at Rockland High School, we're moving in 40 yards of bark. And also at Rockland Elementary, um, there's some weed whacking back by the amphitheater. So that is open to the public at 9 a.m. Okay, I too just want to say the Crystal Apple Award ceremony was amazing. It was so fun to go and honor those teachers. They were uh, voted uh, award recipients by their students. So the students actually got to get up and give a speech about their teacher, and then the teacher came up to accept the award. And it should be said that this was planned and uh, initiated by Trustee Price, who did tons and tons and tons of work to make this happen. Um, and then it's been a, a very busy month, or not even a month. I mean, it has been. It's been a busy month. Um, but looking at uh, the maps, um, and I know we're going to talk more about this in a little while, but there's been um, 10 maps submitted so far and um, lots to look at, lots to consider, lots to think about. Uh, I hope everybody is looking at them, pulling them up, and uh, considering what it might mean to them. And it actually, Travis, would be such an awesome assignment for your students to create one of those maps and learn how to use the tools. Um, I think that should be the homework tonight. Um, so uh, it was really, really fun to hear about all the exciting things that are going on around the district. And since it is the spring sprint, it was exciting to hear about the dances and the proms and balls and all the shopping that's happening out there right now. Um, I want to give a shout out to Craig Rouse. I have been picking his brain and asking him a million questions um, in just trying to understand maintenance and operations and why we go with portables over um, actual stick-built buildings. Um, it is, I've been doing a deep dive and talking to lots of different people, but um, everyone I talk to just basically confirms everything that Craig has said. I do still have a couple more questions about sleepers and gravel, but um, I, I have super appreciated all of your information and the time that you took to show me around and to answer all my questions. And that's it.
feel like you guys have covered a lot. So um, I, I second all of that. Um, yes, thank you, um, you know, Trustee Price, um, for what you did to plan that event. It was really, really nice. Um, and thank you also for listing off all of the names of the employees who were recognized. I think we all kind of were thinking to do that. So thank you. Um, the only other thing um, that is kind of fun is um, my oldest daughter has had her second girls flag football practice slash game um, on Sundays. And after one practice slash game, I love it because it's all in one day. You just like go get in, get out. Um, but she's like, I'm going to play in middle school. I'm so excited. I love it. So I'm very excited that these activities are kind of feeding into these new programs and getting kids excited about it. Um, and thank you, Sophie, for all of your updates. Um, I will be at the Quarry Trail Carnival on Friday, and I actually even got my husband to sign up to work at a booth, too. So every booth is going to have its own cultural um, game from a different part of the world, so we get to learn how to play those and teach the kids, and it should be really fun. Thank you. Sophie, thank you again for your report. Uh, I loved when you mentioned uh, the Bernhardt Museum. Uh, one of my favorite photos of me and my daughter is us dressed up uh, when we went on that field trip. Uh, I, I don't know if she loves it now at this age in her life. Um, I think she's more embarrassed, but I think it's a, a beautiful, fun memory, uh, and I think it's a fun experience for our students to participate in that. So thanks for highlighting that. Um, yes, that, what was that, spring sprint? Is that the phrase? Um, yes, I, we're feeling the spring sprint, um, but I will say, one of the things I love about spring is it gives us a beautiful opportunity to show appreciation and thanks uh, to many, many people that do incredible work. And then we celebrate all that with some beautiful graduations at the end of the year. Uh, so we... Uh, are in that season of celebrating and appreciating Crystal Apple Awards Night was a beautiful opportunity to celebrate uh, teachers nominated by their students. I thought that was very powerful to hear from the students themselves why they nominated their teachers. Um, and what I heard consistently across their board, the board was, uh, my teacher sees me, my teacher cares about me, uh, my teacher has fun with me, uh, I, I have joy when I go into my classroom with my teacher. Um, it, it was really powerful to hear the things that our students were saying. So thank you uh, to those teachers and the many more. I'm sure many of those students would have nominated 10, 15 people if they could have. Um, additionally, I just wanted to highlight as we're in our spring sprint um, that we also have an opportunity to recognize um, incredible teachers and staff at our 28th annual employee recognition. That'll be coming up next month. Um, but I wanted to highlight it because nominations are due soon uh, by April 24th uh, to the site department um, admins. I know an email went out. Um, but employees get to participate in this. And so uh, I look forward to May 23rd recognizing, but just highlighting again, nominations are due by April 24th. With that, oh. I have one more thing. I knew that there was one more thing. Um, just for those who are not in the Springview loop, just wanted to kind of let everyone know that um, one of the eighth grade teachers there, Joe McLean, was nominated for and selected as one of five finalists for the NBC Sports Bay Area California All-Star Teacher Awards. So congrats to him on making the cut. Great. Okay. Superintendent Stock, do you have comments? Uh, believe it or not, I do have a couple. Um, and, and, and so, again, just, uh, just to uh, pick up a few of the themes, um, again, the, 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 the Crystal Apple Award event was... I think also unique in a couple ways is one is uh, it, it, the teachers being honored also got to invite their, their families as well. And often the, the people at home don't hear about the great things they do. So, so to hear the students talk about why and have their families hear that is great. And then we also had majority of our city council there. So a chance for our civic leaders to also you hear firsthand the great things that our, our teachers are doing in their classrooms made it, made it a really unique and special event. Um, uh, the again the thanks to our human resources department and for everyone that nominated so we could do the prize patrol which is amazing to just surprise folks and say you're amazing and we want everyone to know and and, and it's just they're always surprised and they're always um, just so grateful and so appreciate all the work that goes into that and then um, on the labor management work which was significant uh, again is, is as uh, Travis mentioned as well is as uh, just thank you to the board for their continued support of those efforts. They they really do make a difference. And just as as as, as, as I, I won't do the recitation that he did around the phenomenal work, but just to see the sense that we're really 
continuing to focus on the relationships, how we work together, but really thinking around how does this support the teaching and learning? How does this really imp impact the students? And be mindful and intentional around that is really where we want to see uh, the evolution of this because that's really day in, day out what we're all focused on as our students and what goes on in our classrooms. So to have this be another linchpin to that work for to make really Rockland the best it can be for students is, is phenomenal. And, and appreciate the hard work that goes in from everyone involved in it because it is extra, it's above and beyond, but it really makes us a great place. And then I also, if, if people may not know, but we have a very uh, active uh, employee wellness group that is, is led by, out of our, um, by a couple of our folks, human resources, our, our health services supervisor, and along with a committee of people. And they do things throughout the year to make sure employees, no matter what your job is uh, in the district, that you have a chance to have wellness be a part of what you do in Rockland Unified, because we truly care about everyone that works here and their whole being. And we know that if you're in a good space, uh, then you can do come in and do your best for kids. And so, you know, one example was I had the opportunity to play pickleball um, Monday night um, out at Rockland High with a group that they put together. Uh, I know Trustee Price was out the previous week. And, and so, but it was just great to be able to do something for fitness, but also fun as well. And, and so just appreciate the fact that we have folks that intentionally think about the wellness of the people that serve our kids as well. So that, that's what I have. Okay, I have not yet picked up pickleball, but it sounds like I have to now. I will say there were there were many um, schools represented at Run Rockland on Sunday. That was incredibly fun to see. Um, you know, I couldn't actually run with my family because I was trying to take video footage of everybody coming through, um, but I was there with my family, um, and uh, actually my husband participated in his first half marathon, so that was very fun. Um, but it was great to get to talk to a lot of parents, and some staff were out there as well, and so uh, I always love these wellness opportunities to engage uh, not only in our community, but our own wellness. Okay, all comments, final call. Any final comments? <laughs> then we will go ahead and move on with our public hearing for the evening. Uh, item 8.1, I would like to welcome Dr. Justin Levitt from National Demographics Corporation to present item 8.1 on the transition to by trustee area elections, our proposed trustee area maps for the evening. Welcome, Dr. Justin Levitt. Thank you, uh, President Sadhoff, uh, members of the board and members of the community. Um, my name is Dr. Justin Levitt. Let me uh, open up our presentation for tonight. Um, there we go. As always, it's a pleasure to be back here in Rockland and it's a pleasure to present to you some draft maps tonight for our first time. Um, so just to kind of refresh where we are in the process and where we're going, um, we began this process back in January when the district received a demand letter. In March, the board decided to move forward with districting, and on March 20th and April 3rd, we held our first two draft map hearings. Uh, for the last couple of weeks, we have processed uh, 10 maps, including seven community maps and three demographer-drawn maps. Um, and tonight we are doing our first presentation on the draft map. Following tonight's presentation, there's another opportunity for members of the community to submit maps before the May 1st public hearing. Again, we have that window uh, so that there's enough time for us um, to process the maps and to make sure that if we need to reach out or if we need to, if we have any issues with the maps and we can reach out to people who submitted them. Um, I'll tell you, we were, we were getting maps all the way up until midnight on the night that we were accepting maps last time, and we certainly uh, welcome that, but we do have that because we do have that window in order to make sure that we get those processed for the deadline we need to post on. Um, that deadline doesn't come from us, it actually comes from the state of California that says that all maps must be publicly available for viewing for a full seven days, cal you know, full week, before they're presented at a public hearing at which they're discussed. Uh, so, the, so our deadline is April 19th so that we can get the maps published on the 24th for our May 1st hearing. That'll be our next discussion of the maps. Uh, following that, the final map adoption hearing will be on May 15th. Um, again, if there are any revisions or need for changes, we have another window before those maps will be posted um, by May 8th. And then following that, uh, the map gets sent to the county committee on school district organization for Placer County. 
and they'll hold a hearing here in the district. That's where they will confirm or, um, the change of election system from at-large elections to trustee area elections. Um, and kind of as a reminder, these trustee areas uh, will be used through the 2030 election, following the 2030 election when we get the census results back in 2031. The district will have to make sure that districts or the trustee areas are still in compliance with all federal and state law that exists at that time. Um, and again, every 10 years thereafter. Um, just as a brief reminder, this doesn't affect where your child attends school. This also doesn't affect the fact that all board members are responsible to all the residents of the district. Um, and this is really just about that method of election of a board of trustees. So just to kind of briefly talk about our rules and goals, I'm not gonna spend the length of time we did in the first two hearings on this, but I do want to kind of start with these as our evaluation criteria. So for example, um, all maps must comply with the federal requirement that districts have the same number of total residents. All 10 of our maps do comply with that criterion. Uh, similarly, all maps meet our Federal Voting Rights Act requirement. Uh, it is not possible in this district to draw a majority protected class district. Um, so uh, we did evaluate all the maps for that, um, but that's not a requirement here. Um, in the middle column are California criteria, geographic contiguity, really fancy way of saying, you know, that's a good term for the AP geography students, uh, that the district should have one outside boundary. All 10 of our maps actually meet that criterion as well. Uh, there were a couple of maps that didn't on submission, but we fixed the very minor, it was always zero population changes we did to make sure that they did meet that criterion mostly just streets that were misassigned, like literally the width of a street. Um, avoiding divisions of neighborhoods and communities of interest is our next priority. This is where I think a lot of our differences between our maps stem from. And this is something we're gonna come back to as we look at the different maps, um, because these are prioritized in this order for a reason. If there is an issue, for example, with a, a map that say, doesn't follow a major street, but it doesn't do so because there's something we're trying to keep together in terms of communities of interest. That's a valid reason for doing that. Um, I'm gonna skip the third criterion because that didn't really apply here. We do have some non-populated segments of both Roseville and um, Lincoln in the district, but they didn't really affect any of the boundaries here. Uh, so easily identifiable boundaries. This is something like following major roads or other natural and man-made features like rivers, canals, parks, things that serve to divide communities. I'm gonna come back to this criterion as I look at a couple of the maps. And compactness, which the law defines as not bypassing one group of people to get to a more distant group of people. Um, one of the real challenges in the geography as we looked at drawing the maps is that some of the blocks, especially, and this is true of any city that is more recent and has a lot of cul-de-sacs or canyons or other sorts of geography, um, just on the west side of the train tracks, there is a very long block that sort of stems from the northern end of the city almost 75% of the way down the city. And so I know that it impacts every single map. That's something we can't do anything about in terms of compactness. But there are some other couple of cases where I'll point out where it looks like the map has been drawn to bypass a neighborhood. Um, and if that's the case, maybe we can justify it with communities of interest. Um, as you know, we looked at the maps, none of them, I, I don't think any of them are a, you know, a violation of the objective criteria. So I think they're all justifiable. Um, but there are a couple that we'll talk about that look um, like they could be improved slightly. Um, and that lastly, the prohibition in the third column, um, maps should not be drawn for the purposes of favoring or discriminating against an incumbent political candidate or political party. Uh, these maps were both drawn and all 10 of them were analyzed, blind to where the current board members live, blind to the partisan makeup of each of the five trustee areas. Um, and finally, if, if there are other factors that we want to consider, such as trying to equalize the number of school sites, for example, between the districts, trustee areas, um, that could be a taken into account, but only after everything else we're talking about that's required by law. Um, now, the maps are available on our interactive web viewer. 
Uh, this is a great tool we have online on the district's website that allows you to zoom in and out, um, select districts and see some statistics or demographics for each district or trustee area. Um, you can also overlay it on everything from topography maps to um, the demogra some of the socioeconomic demographics that we've talked about previous in previous presentations. So we link that in this presentation, but we really encourage you to uh, view the maps there. Um, we're going to go through the maps um, individually. If there's, if when you do your public comment or when the board wants to make a comment and refer to a specific map, we have each of them on a slide so we can pull them up as needed. Um, we'll start with um, our first few were community maps that we received. Um, in fact, 101 was received the same night as we did our last presentation, I believe. Um, and you know, and you know, you'll see that there are some differences and similarities between the maps. Every map, I think, has one trustee area that is in the very eastern end of the district. So it includes especially all the areas east of interstate of the interstate in I-80, but it also includes a lot of that downtown or central Old Town Rockland area. Um, and then right just west of that is where you see that really long census block. And that census block just runs almost the full length of the, the kind of where the edge of the eastern edge of the district is all the way down past downtown. Um, and so that's gonna be something we see on each of the maps. Um, now this particular map, um, 101, does have um, a couple of districts that do span the length of the, the, the district. So trustee areas four and three and four in green and purple are very long. Um, and they seem to include a lot of communities along those kind of lines. Now, that's again something we might be able to justify using communities of interest, but um, it, it's not certainly may not be the most compact area. Uh, it looks like area two in this map was one of those areas that was kind of the priority and areas three and four were drawn around it. And if there are good reasons for that, that's an example of something that we can do, but we have to justify that. Uh, map 102, um, I, you know, again, we see that there's, um, we, we see a lot of, um, we see very densely populated areas kind of in the southern portion of the district adjacent to Roseville, um, particularly, um, you know, uh, basically where the freeways meet is a very densely populated part of the, of the, of the district. Um, and we see that very long district three again, again, that's the geography of that census area. Uh, we do see that both areas four and five, and especially where the two of those trustee areas meet, we have some areas where they seem to cut through neighborhoods. So for example, area four um, includes most of the area between the Oaks um, and I believe it's Stanford Ranch, um, but not four blocks. There's four blocks it leaves out. Um, could, and that would be something that if we were interested in this map as a general thing, would it be possible to follow that and keep that single development together? And it's very clear on the map that it's one model of home, it's one model of, you know, they're all built around the same time. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking at improving the maps. If there's a valid reason for splitting it this way, then we can talk about that as a good split, but otherwise that could be an option. Um, map 103, um, again, we see Oh, you know, you're seeing a lot of the same patterns, but where we see some differences in this map, uh, the area right along the southern end, especially the southern portion where uh, Roseville kind of comes around and comes up the southern side, uh, and this map is more evenly divided between two and four. So rather than linking the areas around that curve, they have, this map splits them into two separate trustee areas, uh, two and four. Um, again, all three of these maps were submitted by residents of our community. Um, the biggest concern we had with 103 is the area on Park Drive at the north end of Area 2 is, um, it's populated, there's homes along there. There's no way to drive from those homes to the rest of the trustee area. And yes, we have that long block. It's mostly a park. It's mostly a wide open space. Um, and so if we were looking at making this a little bit better at following major roads, there actually is a census block that runs east of Park Drive that we could use as the border and put all the populated area into area three rather than area two. Um, so map 104, um, 
Again, you see, you see a lot of these very similar designs. Notice the colors change because these are all community maps. We use the numbering that the community members used on their own maps. Um, that way, if they want to speak about it and they've written up comments, you'll be able to identify it with the map. Um, but some people started with one on the northwest corner. Other people started with one in Old Town Rockland. And so we have different colors and different numbers. Um, map 105 is the first of our um, ND three NDC drafts. So the NDC drafts are 105, 106, and 107. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about these, and we do invite community members to come and speak about the maps or write up their comments in the emails that they sent. Um, all of those emails um, with, their, you know, with the comments will be provided for you if they include them. Um, one of the things we were looking at doing in this map um, was, you know, first of all, using the attendance areas as much as possible. Um, and I think one of, you know, maybe 106 is kind of the best example of this, but uh, 105, was, that was definitely a priority. Um, we really wanted to create, um, I almost called them like um, quadrant areas. So um, using the major roads and, and division lines to try to um, create a northwest, a southwest, um, a southern and an eastern or district, um, including trying to keep all of the gridded streets in the Old Town Rockland in one area um, and trying to keep all that high density apartments mostly along the south end of, this, of the district together as well. Um, so this one was really highly emphasizing those compactness and major streets. Um, attendance areas played more of a role when we drew 106, um, particularly creating that northern area um, that kind of tried to follow a lot of the, the attendance or um, school boundaries in the north end of the um, north end of the district to the extent possible. Some of them cut across those that, that long block line, but um, where we could, we tried to follow the attendance area boundaries here. Um, one of the things we also tried to do in this map was get um, the middle school um, in, into area five. So in crossing from the gridded streets, um, into where the middle school is just across there uh, to include that and make sure each of the trustee areas had a, a minimum of uh, three school sites um, to the extent we could. Uh, map 107, um, you know, again, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of similar patterns here. I think we looked at um, a lot of similar factors to 105 as well, uh, but tried to keep more of the, um, you know, central area, um, you know, um, in, in central, or sort of the central parts in areas, um, in areas uh, two and four, and not quite come down quite as much with an area, or not, not come down as far. Um, you know, um, so again, we just see some similarities and differences in the different maps. Um, you know, we use, try to use as much of the major roads as possible in these maps um, and do something different than we were seeing in the community maps. We obviously don't want to create just the same map with minor changes at this point in the process. Um, and then we get to um, more community maps. These are the three community maps that were received at the end of the day, 108, 109, and 110. Um, in fact, 110, I believe, was um, received at 11 p.m. on the night we had our cutoff. So, um, 108, um, I think you're going to see this in, a, in 110 as well. Um, it's on the south end of area two in this map, the blue area. Uh, the wraparound um, to get the elementary school, um, that, that's less than perfectly compact because you're bypassing the communities kind of adjacent to between Antelope Creek and um, the, the, in the road there. Um, and so those would be the kind of things that we could look at adjusting if this was a map you like the general feel of. Um, and then map 109, um, you know, again, we see a lot of similar features. I think a lot of the community maps really try to create minimal deviations. Um, and I'll just briefly go, map 110, for example, had a deviation of less than 1%. Um, but in order to get there, you can kind of see the border, especially area three in green, kind of jogs back and forth in order to get that low deviation. Um, 
I would encourage you to think of, or if you like the idea of 110 and the general shapes, we could align, for example, that Area 3 border much better to the major roads within the district, like uh, Stanford Ranch, for example. Um, but um, we were presenting all of these as we, we received them. And that's our commitment, except for those zero population areas to ensure that the district, the, the map, the, you know, that, that it's legal. We're presenting you exactly the map as we receive it. In addition to the maps themselves, we also have sequences of election um, with, that accompany them. Um, and each of these um, has basically three, two, two areas have to be up in 2024, three areas up in 2026. The education code policy generally dictates that if there is a trustee that is up for election in 2026, and they are either the only one in, residing in a trustee area, or there are more than one but trustee, but they both have a 2026 election cycle, that area must be put up in 2026. Um, the later of the two years. And that's sort of an interpretation of an education code provision about how you sequence elections when you're switching to uh, districts. And so our legal team, I didn't do this personally, our legal team put together these sequences of election based on um, their knowledge of the terms, uh, the, each, each board member's term. Um, and you can see here that there are some options in some of the maps. So for example, in map 101, we have three vacant, or we have three seats that have a question. And you would have a question generally if the seat was either vacant, um, you know, or, or sometimes in some cases, if there are two trustees that have different election cycles. Um, normally, and so normally that would require um, a designation of, of which trustee, which, which trustee area would elect in which year. Um, and so we put the options for you here in map one, for example, we think areas three and five would, would be assigned to 2026, and two of the three remaining areas, one, two, and four, would need to be assigned to the 2024 election. The remaining, the, the, the last of those three would be assigned to 2026. Um, and that could either be, that's generally speaking best done by the board who knows the areas and who knows, um, for example, um, may wanna create a mix of parts of the district that have an election in the same year. So we don't have all the areas in the west having the same election year and then the two areas in the east, kind of the same, or you know, th principles like that. Um, and so each map does have that accompanying sequence of election. And as you can see, a lot of the maps do have um, that choice. Two of three areas uh, must be up in 2024. So with that, um, our hope tonight would be that um, we would be able to discuss the maps and following a discussion of the maps, um, we would love to be able to um, either narrow down the number of maps. Um, there's a lot of them that are similar or have similar features or maybe it's a pick and choose different features between the maps. Um, and then any requests for modifications that we could come back with an improvement. Um, something that we often see at this stage in the process could be something like either I like this map, but can we align this boundary to the major roads? Can we fix this particular problem on the map? Or another common thing is I like this western area in this map, and I like the eastern areas in this map. Can we figure out a way to put them together to make one map that combines two different maps? Leave the details up to us. We'll come back with that new map for you at the next hearing. Um, but that's kind of a very common request. We really like the way that you used this street in the east. But we really think that the west is better served on this alignment. So can we figure out a way to put these two maps together? Generally, we, we do that a lot to come up with the final map. So um, with that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to address them on any specific map or about anything. Thank you for uh, the wonderful presentation and the detailed information. Um, just a point of clarification, because we are a unified school district, I believe it was map 106 that you said you attempted to utilize attendance boundaries, creating a minimum of three schools. I'm assuming that's looking at it, elementary school boundaries. Could you just clarify that for us? Were middle schools or high schools taken into consideration? Um, so 
they were less taken into consideration. I mean, the school sites themselves were taken into consideration because we were trying to balance them because there weren't enough to have three elementary schools in each of five trustee areas. Um, so, you know, if we can put a middle school or, you know, and we have a cluster of schools right in the center of the city that kind of have to stay together geographically um, mm -hmm. in a lot of maps. Um, but, um, you know, we didn't use the high school or middle school areas, our attendance areas or trust school boundaries as much uh, because there aren't as many of them as there are the elementary areas. Um, if there is a particular section of a boundary um, that you would like us to consider more, we can really strive to do that. Um, but it's, you know, with, with, with fewer high schools and middle schools than there are trustee areas, that becomes like, okay, we can use it as a boundary, but mm -hmm. there's gonna be more than one trustee area that send their kids to this particular, mm -hmm. to Whitney High or to. Yeah, no, I understand the difficulty. So yeah. thank you so much. That's, thank you for clarifying too. I think a few people yeah. were asking me that question. So thank you for clarifying. Would you mind just giving us um, some examples? I know we talked about our last meeting, communities of interest. I know we talked about, you know, some of the things to consider major roads, elementary attendance boundaries, HOAs, any others? that you would suggest? Um, so, I, I mean, though you've listed off several really okay. important ones. Um, and it's really also thinking about development patterns. I think, um, you know, um, one very common one in, in communities like Rockland is when were certain communities developed or built mm -hmm. um, and the different needs of an, an older community versus a newer population. Okay, thank you. Can you also clarify, how many would you like us to get down to tonight? So, um, you know, if we have, we, we have 10 maps, and I think some of them have a lot of features in common with each other. If we um, could narrow down to around three, okay. say two to four, you know, if we, um, in, 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 like, in, besides any new maps that were requested or revisions that were requested, um, it could be something like, we like map, I'm just gonna pick a random one, 104. But, and so we're gonna keep that in for now, but we want you to make some modifications to it. And then hopefully the next meeting you just say, we like the modified map and you can get rid of the original 104. Thank you. I'm not, just curious, not, yeah. ha, and you've done this obviously way more than we have. Is there um, any thought on, we, we go through and say, is anybody interested in discussing any of these? So we eliminate some maybe addition, you know, initially right at the beginning, or what would you suggest? Um, so, I mean, I'm happy to work with the board however the board would like. <coughs> Typically, you might want to say, um, you know, see if you're on the same page as each other. Okay. Um, just give your top, each of you can give your oh, top, top maps. Three. Okay. Um, we like to think of this as not eliminating maps tonight, mm -hmm. but as focusing the conversation down on the best maps. So yeah. if each of you give three maps, then maybe we have a total of four to five total. Mm -hmm. That would definitely be an improvement over have bring 10 maps back. You know, I, I think this also being the, the first opportunity for the community to really try maps and look at maps and hear your feedback on the maps. I, I'm sure those that wrote maps or submitted maps are probably hearing your feedback, you know, first time right now too and going, oh wait, we might be open to that little change. So I, I wonder if it's helpful to really kind of maybe highlight a few of the, the topics of interest, if there's a specific map that is somebody really loves, feel free. Um, but I'd really love to start out a little bit if it's okay with, you know, what are some things that are maybe important to you? Because there might be a map that you could alter or change and it might be a great map, but there was maybe one or two concerns within it, it could be fixed, right? Um, so I think let's leave it open to the trustees because we're not necessarily declining any maps tonight. You're just asking for a little more direction so you know if we want you to um, revisit some maps for us for the next meeting, is that correct? Exactly. We, we often call them focus maps because the idea is we can, you know, focus the conversation on maps that we think do a, serve as a good starting point. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify for the community, um, I just want to make sure we open the public hearing for those that have submitted cards too. But um, because you have given the presentation and the board does have the opportunity to talk with you, it is appropriate for the board to ask some questions of his presentation and talk with him before we formally open the public hearing. I just wanted to clarify that. So I'll start out by just throwing out, um, I haven't um, had a ton of feedback from the community yet. I think everybody was probably waiting to hear your response to the maps. Um, but I have seen some interest in, um, 
in HOAs or development staying together. And I did notice several maps kind of did break up some of those. Um, and so I, I, again, I just share publicly, I, I've heard some interest about that. You know, we do have some developments in our community, HOAs in our community, that there, you know, Dr. Levet, if there may be an HOA community that had sections of the development built at different times, um, have you seen that where if a map is built by when it was built, you may actually they'll be breaking up that HOA group. Um, so I'm a little concerned about that. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely, and I, I agree with you. And um, I think there's, I was giving examples of things that could potentially be communities of interest, but um, I, I grew up in a community that was a planned community that started construction in 85 and ended in 99. So mm -hmm. I certainly know like, it's, a, it's very much a community of interest, but it has that development history. Um, and so what I wanted to say was like, in some cases, the, the, you know, this is really one of those things where communities of interest can depend on even the neighborhood we're talking about. And so for some neighborhoods, this particular community, um, just to give a couple examples I know in Sacramento, you know, Natomas, for example, built out over a period of 30 years, but they have a clear community of interest despite that. Um, on the other hand, you know, in other neighborhoods, it might be more appropriate to talk about, well, these homes are all date to, you know, the 1920s and 30s. This other section was developed uh, in, you know, in the last 15 years, and they have very different issues. So it really comes to the neighborhood specifically. So I agree with you. Because I did notice, though, some of the, the later maps or like the even even some of the maps that you presented, the like 105, 106, it looked like some of those communities were broken up. Um, and if we have, then, uh, you know, I would hope that we could fix that um, or, or we could at least be able to tell you what the reason was. Like, I'm sure some of the elementary boundaries cross some of those um, areas. Yeah, I'm, I'm, are we just asking questions or are we starting to talk about some of our thoughts or where are we at? Um, the first item is the presentation and the board to give thoughts to him. It can, be, it can be thoughts and questions. I got clarification on that. And then we will formally open up the public hearing for all public comment. Okay, um, but not talking about the maps that we kind of, kind of gravitated toward or, okay, I, I don't wanna say the wrong thing. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you for this, um, thank you to those in the community that took time to do this as well. Um, so one thing, and I, I definitely see, you know, in the maps um, that you all created, um, that compactness piece of it, um, I found myself gravitating more toward a few of the community <laughs> developed maps. Um, and, you know, and I don't know, I'll be interested to see what the rest of you think, given that I think we've all lived here for quite a long time and are familiar with the neighborhoods and things. Um, but one of the things in regards to communities of interest that really sticks out to me is like the old Rockland and the side where there are older schools and schools that have maybe been traditionally fall under Title I status, that that, um, to me is like a community of interest because I know we've heard from members of the community. Um, you know, those schools just, they don't raise as much money, you know, through their PTCs. They sometimes don't have access to some of the things that some of our other schools in other areas of the city have. Um, for that reason, some of the maps that, like I see that the ones that you guys created started down in like that Antelope Creek Southern part, but rather than kind of coming upward um, to be more of that narrow. You guys went kind of to the west, um, but to me that breaks up some of that old Rockland where we could have two distinct districts that make up those older schools. Um, so I, I found that I was kind of gravitating toward 103, 104, and then 102, um, but agree that there are some some of, there were a couple other ones I was looking at, but it's, it's almost like as you start to say, well, we could pull from here and then we could add here and pull from, it almost starts to become a different map. So I, I found that those were the three that I could look at and kind of visualize them making sense without a ton of 
a ton of overhaul and pulling from one and adding to another. Um, 103, um, I think, creates those two. I felt like it looked pretty compact. Um, I did agree with the comments that you made about that park drive up at the top, and I think it also would um, go to President Sadhoff's piece about some of the HOA and keeping that together. If that makes sense with the numbers, um, that would be a, a really good move, I thought. Um, with 104, um, just looking at that District <coughs> 2, and I noticed this, I, I would imagine as we focus in on certain maps that you guys would clean them up, because like there's that little chunk that kind of comes out in District 2, and you know, there's like one side of the street that's in District 1 instead of 2, that ideally that little piece would get incorporated into 2. Um, I think it's still, it still splits some of Rucola, but they are still in the same middle school and high school districts. Um, and I don't, you know, there's like a little piece in three that sticks up, but that may be no, no homes there, I'm not sure. Um, and then 102 is not as clean looking as far as the boundaries. Um, the only couple things that stuck out the most were like in, in District 2, at kind of the top close to where it says Loomis, there's like a little end of that neighborhood and um, a couple, there's like a couple little offshoots into, into three, <coughs> into the green, and then there's a couple little offshoots into one. I don't think it's very many houses could get kind of pulled into two. And then on- They were trying to use the railroad track. Yeah, but maybe. They didn't take it all and then on the other end of two, by Rucola, again, there's um, like some of those streets, like it seems like Park Drive should, yeah, should include that little chunk, so basically west of Park Drive. Um, so I, I, I guess that was just, you know, as I scrolled and scrolled, it seemed like those three to me, knowing what I do about communities of interest across the city, seemed to require the least amount of and, and I would tweets. just say that that's exactly the kind of feedback that I can take and come back with a revised version that tries to accomplish all of those things and hopefully would serve the district. Could you pull up map 103? I um, also found myself really drawn to 103 and 104. The top, very top right corner of the district five um, that actually is a Whitney Oaks um, court. You see it's got a couple little, do you know, are you looking at this little spot right here? Mm -hmm. um, so that I think we would want to keep with um, three because that's part of Whitney Oaks. Um, and then, yeah. yeah that's I, I'm that's not, all part of the park drive issue. Yes, I, I, I think that that needs to be fixed. The other thing that I wanted to point out on 104 is that um, I know in our demand letter it mentioned the um, Latino, which we don't have um, a high geographic concentration of. However, the thing that I really was drawn to about Map 104 is that it had a 26% um, Asian population. And I think that that is our highest concentration. I think it was pulled from the Twin Oaks neighborhood. And so I really like that that um, was represented in um, Map 104. Um, I would like to better understand the into why that little, you know, area is pulled out. I don't know if there was a high population specific to that or if you know why that little area. My, the, mm -hmm. my suspicion is that it is to do with population. Yeah. But one of the things we could try to do, if you like 104, is is there a way of doing that? A lot of the mm -hmm. community maps have very low deviations. Mm -hmm. And we have some room there. Um. So that that area that is pulled out um, is still part of Cressley Springs, but it is a different builder. Um, so I'm I'm not a ten about pulling that out. I was just curious, you know, if that changed our numbers on population percentage or population numbers. Um, but other than that, that met um, you know a lot of the communities of interest. Um, I felt like HOAs were taken into account, neighborhoods. Um, seem to make sense. I think I was going to add up the number of years the five of us have lived in Rockland. It would be it would be a lot. So that's a, a good thing, you know. Yeah. I think 
I, you know, just one of the things that's in one of the layers, it would be, uh, and again, it, and I tried to do it where you put the elementary school boundary layers and then you have the maps, what happens if the colors start merging and it gets really confusing. But I would like to, there's some, I think the elementary school boundaries do a good job of kind of using natural divisions other than Parker Whitney and the railroad track. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you're, you're talking so small, but if we could keep to using the elementary school boundaries where possible, because there's natural divisions with the elementary schools. I, I get Whitney and Rockland and Granite Oaks and Springview. Mm -hmm. You've only got those two school or the, the two schools in each grade level. So it's not, you're never going to be perfect there. But from a high level standpoint, you could theoretically have two elementary schools and every two plus in everyone's area. And again, if, if it works, but it, it, those, those were nice. Those were nice cut ups when you start overlaying them. They make some natural boundaries in places around roads and things. So. And I do think 103 seemed to, none of them perfectly perfect. follow, but <laughs> that one did um, seem, and actually 104 was, was kind of Close. similar too. Um, yeah, but the 10, um, yeah. It does, uh, <laughs> like I, I, would, I would like go, like toggle back and forth kind of. Yeah quickly mm -hmm. and it would help help me mm -hmm. to understand it better yeah. like on off on mm -hmm. off okay but I thought 103 and 104 they there was some um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whoop, whoop. yes one other thing about 103 on um, trustee area one why is this additional little pink yeah, little jagged square. edge yeah the little square yeah, that, that's the population there. population so if you just okay. go across on the railroad track you are you need, you don't have You have to have a few more, so yeah, you, you can't. somewhere. Okay, um, and I don't, I, are any of you familiar with that neighborhood or can picture, you know, is that gonna feel strange for, for that, for them or for that neighborhood? Pacific and Sunset, that's heading up the hill. I know it does, yeah. I don't think it. I, but they're Tri-City. It's. Um, it, it is. It's it is. Bolt, it's Bolton. It's that right across from the baseball diamonds. I actually don't think it's a bad cut. I don't. Sorry. No, I don't think it's a bad cut. I don't think it's a bad cut because it's a very distinct neighborhood. It is. Mm -hmm. it is high density apartments. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. High density it is. apartments. Um, but um, and so I think the option is that little cut, or as we see in 104 and many of the other maps, or 104 actually goes south. Yeah go south toward Antelope Creek. Um, some of the other maps go into the gridded streets um, that are kind of um, still there on the other side of the train tracks. So those are the options. It has to cross somewhere just to get under that 10%. And that's really the question of where. Yeah, I, 104 looks good too. Mm -hmm. And then it keeps more of and the I, grid all on the District 5 side. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I would say from a, I guess 104, if you look at area four, there's a valley view. If you look at the valley view cut, Mm -hmm. on the north side of where right. four is, mm -hmm. as opposed to running. I mean, I, I don't know if there's probably nothing there, but if you just kept it in line with where Valley View, the the, district, the elementary school boundary is, it makes an even cut. It probably doesn't affect any people, but it would just be a nice. Yeah, because there's that ridge there, because then right next to that is, is all the older, like Parker Whitney boundary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing, though, that was probably a population decision, though, because, look, if you cut that out, you're going to have high population here and low population cut, cut there. What out? Uh, like in four along the northern part of four? Four along the northern part. It's, so, it's one of these that makes upper right lot. Right. I, that's, that's exactly where I wish we could have drawn the line. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, right. Right. <laughs> that yeah. census block um, that I mentioned. That it basically goes from the north end of the district almost all the way down to, um, yeah, basically Parker Whitney Elementary. Um, so basically, and if, like, and if you take that, then you then we play the shot. The and that that the, so that's why almost every map has that elongated area yes. that in mm -hmm. it because that's literally one census block. Um, but I understand there's no people in there, so um, we can we can kind of keep it in the block that makes the most sense, yeah. but. Yeah.
Because it, it doesn't have an impact on voters. Right. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Try and use the elementary yeah. school boundaries because mm -hmm. they're the most logical. Okay. I think they, if you're looking for consensus, if, I mean, as far as if you want to know how each of the board members are thinking about it, all the things I was going to say have already been said at, on 102, 103, and 104 is where I'm landing. Yeah, right. It's not set. We're not voting on it, right? Yeah. But it would be nice to see those with kind of some of the refinements that, yeah. So if I, if I could suggest then, could we do the public hearing? And then we can come back and uh, maybe, yeah. I now officially open the public hearing to gather community input regarding proposed trustee area maps and election sequencing pursuant to elections code section 10010A2. We do have a public comment card. We have Kevin Cooper. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, so I have a lot of concerns about this process. I do project management for a living, PMBOK, certifications, graduate degrees. And the communication plan from this process is way too fast and it's not nearly as many people in the community showing up at these meetings. I popped in there and took a look through the notes and I'm sorry guys, whatever collected those notes to post them, they were intelligible. In addition to the fact, when you take a good look at the way the city's broken up, we don't have any natural boundaries or natural groups from a, um, the goals that the state sort of shares as far as uh, collecting different uh, protected classes. So there's a lot of concern I have about this process, especially given setting aside all the political issues that I could go on for a million laughs. So um, I'm watching it. I'm going to dive into it. Statics. Statistics and forecasting is what I did for a big part of my career, and so I'm concerned. Set that aside. Um, I did not get a chance to come and thank you all for something that was really cool. I didn't get a chance to go to the Maker Fair. It occurred last year. I didn't get to come and thank you guys for whatever role you guys had in putting that together. And I owe a thank you to the city council. Anyway, um, thank you all for your time, and uh, God bless you all. Oh, and I did send in some questions to Mr. Stock, I'm expecting those to be answered. I have more coming. And I'm super frustrated that when I ask questions, I don't seem to get any answer back. So I need to know how and where to push the question because they're valid. Thank you. Anything else? No? Uh, Mr. Cooper, I, I received an email and I responded and, and I'm... Oh. I... I Right, no, no, I appreciate that and, and, and want to just make sure you're getting answers, not that you necessarily will agree with the answers, but you're getting an answer to the questions. Perfect, thank you, sir. Okay, seeing no other public comment cards, I will officially close the hearing. Trustees were able to continue a uh, conversation and give possible direction to our demographer this evening. I'll jump in. I was hearing some consensus on a few maps. Um, I, I will say, I don't know that I am quite at the point to say that elementary school boundaries are the, are the highest priority for me, if I'm just being honest. Um, uh, I think the the number of, of families that that serves and represents is not a large portion of the entire district size, so I get a little nervous about that. Um, but I do think it's something important to look at. Um, I, I do still see, I wanna dive into these maps of interest a little bit further to really look close at the neighborhoods. Um, I, I do think neighborhoods staying together is really important. Um, and, uh, 
I think in many ways that will be our elementary school attendance boundaries, but I think that it actually conflicts in a few spots in the city. So those are just some of my own personal comments as you're redrawing or relooking at the maps. Um, maybe there's a way that you take options into consideration for both of those or separate maps for each of those requests. Would you say though that he already did, that you already did in map 106? That was your attendance area map focus. Um, so certainly that was the map that we I really tried to focus in okay. on that. Okay. Um, and again, like you know, I would say it's very common that it's not one of the consultant maps. Yeah. You know, I have no attachment to which map gets uh, oh, good. <laughs> selected. We don't need that. Um, okay. In Perfect. fact, I, I kind of have heard that 102, 103, and 104 mm -hmm. are kind of the three focus maps at this point. Um, and yeah. but the, but with modifications mm -hmm. to them, um, and you know we can cert you know if if that would be okay to take that as direction from tonight, um, we can come back with a revised map versions that implement some of those changes um, that requested by the board. Um, now, particularly for 103 and 104, I think I have a very good idea of what the board is asking for in terms of modifications. Um, and I know I mentioned a couple of issues with 102, particularly with area four or five. Mm -hmm. Are there other changes to map 102 that you would like me to look into? Um, Maybe we should go back through and say okay. what people like about 102. Um, what are the things that yeah. you know we would want to have modified? I'm I'm not a big fan of this. In fact, when you said top three, I was thinking, oh, I really have two favorites, um, two that I prefer. And, and if that's the case, and 102 was just mentioned once, but we don't want to include it, then we can go with 103 and 104 as the focus map. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's fine. I d there are things I like about 102, but it is a little. I think would require a little bit more adjusting than say the other two do. Um, so, you know, I might personally kind of keep looking at it as we go through the process, but um, yeah, I think I, I am not, you know. And just to clarify, all maps remain posted and available as options. You're just asking if there's a mapper, a few maps you want to make changes to to bring back to us, but we can still consider all maps at the next hearing, correct? That, that's certainly correct. And really, it's just, this is just about um, being able to go back at the next, or to the community after tonight's meeting and say, you know, we really were focusing in tonight on 103 and 104, that's what it is. And we're gonna make some modifications to these maps, but like this is where we're leaning tonight. Nothing goes away, nothing's eliminated, all the maps remain posted. And maybe somebody who did one of the other maps hears what the board's feedback and wants to revise their own map to make it better. And that becomes the map that we look at as the focus map next time. So both of these are community maps, correct? So the person who um, submitted the map could actually go in and make modifications just by listening. And that though, would, would it, that would be a different map if they resubmitted or would it be the same map only resubmitted? So what, the way this will work is that I'm taking your feedback from tonight on the things we discussed. If either the, and there were two different submitters, 103 and 104 of different people uh, submitted them. If either one of them goes back and submits a new map um, or any member of the community were to submit a revision that was based on 103 and 104 but made changes, and I look at that map and say, this is exactly what the board asked for, then um, this is why we use numbers. Because if two random, we've actually had this, where two random members of the community submit the exact same map without <laughs> talking to each wow. other. We just use the number and we tell them both, you're both map 116, you know. So we'll, we'll you know, that's the way I would approach it. Like um, map 111, it was submitted by a resident of the community, but I think that it meets all your requests for revision to 103. But what I was really wondering about is if you, for example, took map 104 and you made revisions and the submitter made revisions, would it come back, both of your submissions come back as 104? Or would it be, oh, would they get renamed? It, we're, gonna, we're gonna use new numbers. Okay. That's to prevent any confusion. So um, the in the presentation, it'll say map 111, and then next to it, it'll say, you know, board revisions to 103. Okay. So 
but we'll make it clear those two maps or you know maybe three maps that are responsive. Any other thoughts from the trustees? I'm hearing some consensus on um, our demographer coming back with focus maps of 103 and 104. Okay, great. Well, I thank you uh, for your work on this, and I look forward to seeing those maps as you bring them back for our next public hearing. And just an encouragement to the community, uh, feel free to reach out to us and continue to sit more maps for our next hearing um, if there are concerns. Uh, but thank you again for your time this evening. Okay, we will now move forward with our agenda to the consent calendar. Um, all matters listed under the consent calendar are to be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion followed by a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the Board of Trustees request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. Any items removed will be voted upon following the motion to approve the consent calendar. We did, however, receive a public comment card for an item, uh, item 9.6, that is on the consent. Um, so at this time, I will welcome Harley Larson to come for two minutes to present his comment to the board. Hello, board. Harley Larson, Reen Brocklin. At the March 20th meeting, there was some additional information provided on the legal services budget, including a graph of the actual amount spent. One thing that jumped out at me on this graph was that it started in the 2019-2020 school year with $850,000 spent on legal services. I was curious, so I took a look at 2017 and 2018, and both years were budgeted under $200,000. The district clarified budgeted amounts are almost always over the actual spent. So back then we were spending less than $200,000 a year on legal services. Since then, in the election of our current board majority, we've averaged over $820,000 in legal services each year. Since just last month, the projected budget has jumped another $65,000. Superintendent Stock, at that March 20th meeting, you said one of the results of having better collaborative experiences is that we don't incur the legal fees Related to negotiations with our labor partners, I would remind you, the board, and the community that the district has been in unnecessary labor negotiations for almost a year due to the board majority's gender notification policy. A labor complaint the teachers literally begged to drop at the February 7th meeting if only you would rescind your illegal, unnecessary, and unpopular policy. And what was your response? President Sadoff, you verbally accosted our RTPA rep, maybe the biggest labor partner the district has. If anyone missed it, you can watch it on YouTube. Once would be a mistake, but the disdain this board has shown to anyone opposed to its decisions is a pattern of behavior that is not in line with what the district teaches to our students. Thank you, Harley. We will now move on with the consent calendar. Does any trustee wish to remove an item from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action? I'd like to remove 9.9 .9 for separate discussion and action. Okay, any other removals? Okay, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda item minus item 9.9? .9? So moved. Second. First by Trustee Price, second by Trustee Hupp. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Julie Hupp? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Thank you, motion passes. Trustee Counter, you requested to remove consent item 9.9 .9 for separate discussion and action. Can you please share with the board? Yeah. So 9.9 um, .9 is the comprehensive school safety plans. They're done every year. And I would say, again, love them. For, for those of you that don't know in the audience and those of you listening at home, um, this is a great committee that's put together. The team is usually three to 10 people, depending on the school site. <laughs> That's the principal, admin, teachers, parents. There's a, you know, it could be a, an employee, it could be a, a student. And these are a great opportunity for you in the community and in your relative school district, especially at the elementary level, because we have so many of them, but it's also for middle school and high school to get involved, to help out, to develop, to modify, to promote, to improve, to foster, to strengthen, all these things. This is your opportunity in the community to be involved. 
um, and have, you know, have your say and have your, have be part of the conversation from a priority standpoint and a strategic um, decision. So there's three main sections, each one of these things, and I apologize, I'm explaining. So each one of these things is about 100 pages. Mm -hmm. The first one to 20 is really the, I guess, the meat of it. Everything from about 20 on, and I'm plus or minus a few pages, so I will apologize, um, is all reference stuff. So if you're really into that, you can you know, print them off and review. But there's three main sections of the comprehensive safety plan. The first one is the initial assessment, and that really provides, um, I guess, reference data on suspension, expulsions, uh, disciplinary data, attendance, um, gets into the California Healthy Kids Survey, which is really from fifth and sixth grade. Um, and then it, it talks more about just kind of some historical metrics. Again, from a continuous improvement standpoint, I think there's an opportunity to consolidate that, put it in more of a grid format. There's formats, but hey, every, everyone has a little bit different way of presenting it, so that. Um, section two is the first action plan, it's people and programs, and that's really about the culture of the school. Um, it goes away from everything about it's very site specific. It talks about being connected, having positive social interactions, caring, um, excelling in academics, behavioral, emotional, emotional safety, all those things. So from a parental standpoint, if you're in, if, if you, if you want to have a part in your community and have a part in your school, those are opportunities where you can jump in, help out, and, and those are amazing. Some of the things, and I, I will apologize because I don't have all the uh, acronyms, so but in that first section, you got PBIS, Swiss, SS, SST, and UDL data. They're very site specific. There's some that talk about IB and big little buddies and events, equity training, yard duties, clubs, crossing guards, intramurals, restorative practices, um, individualized learning, SEL traits, student leadership, touch of leadership, award tickets, equity cohort, equity and inclusion committee, stop, walk, and talk, team building, student peacekeepers, parent volunteers, et cetera, et cetera. These are all the great things that are happening at the school. And if, you, if you're into that stuff, you wanna be a part of it, this is a great thing. If there's something that you don't understand, be a part of it. If there's something that, hey, this doesn't make sense, again, reach in, be a part of it. These are great things. At the high school and middle school, that section's more probably curriculum development, talks about vape and Narcan, some other things that are out there more of mature students, but the elementary schools and things, I think it would be nice to see, again, continuous improvement. If we're gonna focus on some things, there's probably some metrics we can tie to, to if we're gonna make decisions and actions, hopefully they tie towards making something better or improving or maintaining a metric. But again, a lot of metrics in there, a lot of things. The, the other section, this is the last part, it's the action plan. So this is your traditional safety plans, folks. So this is site-specific, state-mandated, the number of fire drills, the lockdown drills, the run, hide, and fight, the off-campus evacuations, on-campus evacuations, duck and cover, et cetera, et cetera. There's some other things that get included, campus visits, walkie-talkies, drop-off pickup, et cetera, et cetera, that are out there on that other section, and I'm sure there's some editing that can move around so it makes it, but I think this is a great opportunity again. Um, these things set the expectation for staff, students, and family. These are opportunities for parents to be engaged uh, fostering that culture, you know, pros and cons. And then each school, there's a little bit of a varying opportunity to be involved. So if you want to, if this is something you're into, reach out to your site, school site council, reach out to the principals, um, get involved. This is one of those great things. They happen every year. You're setting the strategy for your school. So if you want to do that, I think this is just a great opportunity. I know I'm probably selling it too much, but I just wanted to call it out. This is a lot of work that gets put together. And I think it's an opportunity. I hear from people like, how do I get involved? This is a great example to get involved. So, did I catch everything? Absolutely. <laughs> so with that, I, I, I just want to say thank you to that. I, I will approve or I will vote to move it forward. I just wanted to call those out because it's a lot of work and it's just an opportunity for people to be involved. Yeah, thank you for sharing and explaining. Uh, definitely important work being done. So I appreciate you highlighting all the incredible work. Um, and then also, um, I think back in the day, we called that a cliff note summary. So I appreciate that for all the parents listening, right? So great job. Yeah, we got some people clapping on that summary. So thank you uh, for that. Um, so I'm hearing a motion to approve 9.9 so by moved. Trustee Counter. Is there a second? Second. By Trustee Price. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Julie Hupp? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay. We will now move on to item 10.1. I now welcome Mr. Craig Rouse, our Senior Director of Facilities, Maintenance, and Operations, to assist us with a public hearing regarding school facilities impact fees. 
Good evening, Board President Satov, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. Just a little bit earlier, you guys approved um, on the consent agenda, the 2024 Development Impact Fee Nexus Study. And now staff would like to um, recommend holding a public hearing with regard to the proposed increase in school development impact fees from $4.79 to $5.17 per square foot. That's for residential construction and then from 78 cents to 84 cents a square foot for commercial construction. And this would take place effective June 16, 2024. Thank you. I will now open the hearing officially. I open public hearing to increase school facilities impact fees on residential and commercial development effective June 16, 2024. See no public comment. I will now close the hearing. Mr. Rouse, will you please continue on with item 10.2, the resolution for number 23-24-34, authorizing the increase in school facilities impact fees on residential commercial development effective June 16, 2024. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're bringing forward a recommendation tonight to approve resolution number 23-24-34. And this is authorizing the increase in school facility impact fees on residential and commercial development and that the effective date for this increase shall be on June 16th, 2024, and this is 60 days from its adoption if we approve it tonight. Seeing no comments or questions, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. First by Trustee Counter, second by Trustee Hupp. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Julie Hupp. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Michelle Sutherland. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 10.3, we now ask Jennifer Stolliber, our Deputy Superintendent of Business and Operations, to join Mr. Rouse to present the Portable Building Replacement Project Delivery. Good evening, President Sadoff, uh, board members, and Superintendent Stock. And excuse me, I'm getting over a little congestion related allergies because a lot of us are going. So we're um, revisiting this item from a couple of meetings ago where we had some questions come up. And so um, as uh, Member Hub uh, discussed earlier, Craig has done a lot of research um, and a lot of good work to answer those questions. So tonight we're gonna go through that. So we brought back that same presentation. We just updated some of the information. So like on this slide, you see that we included um, the prior meeting and then added this one to it. This is the same information that was shared previously. On this slide, we realized um, one of the questions during that board meeting was if this was in rank order based on the assessment that Craig and his team had performed. And at that time, I thought it was. But when we reviewed it afterwards, we realized it was not. So this slide does look a little different. And that's because we put it in rank order based on their scores during that assessment. And so you'll be able to reference back to this based on the decision to see which ones would be addressed first based on the number that um, we come to when a decision is made for the total. Again, this was some information related to funding um, because we have different sources and some of the sources are restricted in what projects they could pay for. Um, and now I'm gonna hand it off. Okay, so I'll pick it up from here. So. Um, we're gonna just gonna go over um, what we did last time, and it's talking about the portable classroom buildings, a modular classroom building, permanent built classrooms, and then cost comparison and next steps. But as we talk about the portable classroom building, we're gonna uh, talk, also review some additional enhance, enhancement options that have been uh, asked for us to do a little research on. So a portable classroom building, just you know, real quick uh, recap, is, is a building that is built off-site in a manufacturing factory, and it's trucked into the school site, and it's either craned or offloaded on a, a truck. And then uh, a portable classroom building is built on a dirt pad with wood foundation. And it's also important to note that portable buildings are relocatable. So based on demogra demographic uh, swings in the district, we can pick those buildings up and, and move them as the enrollment shifts in the district. Out of the three options that we discussed at the last board meeting, a portable classroom building has the, 
least amount of approval time. That's going through your design phase and um, your division of the state architect and also the manufacturers. Some of the uh, enhancement options that were uh, brought forward, and we you know, did a little research on this, is um, what if you put stucco on the exterior walls instead of plywood T111, T111 plywood? And then um, talked about a, a gable pitch roof instead of a slanted slope roof, and then adding some skylights. One, uh, one, the first option, if, if you go with the exterior stucco, uh, I did find out from the manufacturers that the weight of the stucco and the need to have a concrete foundation for this portable building to hold the weight of the building does not make that a relocatable option in the future. So it's a portable with permanent if you go with stucco and concrete foundations. The gable pitch roof um, is a real uh, easy roof uh, option that you could get through ma uh, manufacturing and design. And um, the two skylights are, are very minimal also. And then here's a photo of uh, our last portable that we dropped uh, last year for the before and after school program at Cory Trail. And then a quick recap on the modular classroom building. These buildings are also built off-site in a factory and they're trucked in and they're usually craned in on site because this pad for the, the, the house, a modular building, has to be on a, a concrete slab, not a dirt foundation. So they usually bring a crane on site and they drop the, uh, the modular buildings uh, on the pad the duration for a modular classroom building is about two months longer on, on the upfront design with the architect and DSA. And then there's some additional requirements that the state requires. You have to have geotechnical and a, and a geo, uh, geological uh, survey review, and that could take up to five months with DSA submittal. So portable classroom building is a quicker timeline for approval. Next in line would be the modular building, but also pushes you a little bit further out. So you have to really pre-program out these projects if you go a different option than a portable building. And then a permanent built classroom uh, is traditional construction. And this is when they come out and they, they put a foundation in the ground, just like your home. They, they build it, it's one step after the other. Um, and it just takes a longer timeline to, to build these types of projects. And it's also a much longer duration on the design end. So as you can see, portable classroom was four weeks, modular was 12 weeks, and then you go into a permanent built, it goes to 28 to 32 weeks on the front end to design. And then as, the, uh, as we talked about with the modular classroom, you still have to do the same additional requirements um, to, to get your project approved. So th this slide here talks about what we reviewed last at the last board meeting, and this is the cost comparison if we didn't have any enhancements added to affordable building. As you can see, we have 32 portables, um, 24 modulars, and then 13 on the permanent build. So this is the, a slide that we added, and this is the cost comparison with the enhancement options. And as you can see, we added a couple columns here. We talked about. Um, the additional cost for ex the exterior wall stucco with concrete foundations, and then what it would cost for a gable roof, and then for skylights. And then it, uh, you can see we went from 32 to 29 portables because of the additional cost. And then we dropped down also on the modular buildings. And then on, on the permanent build, that a permanent build is basically designed for that weight. So there really isn't any additional cost if you go with stucco. Um, or wood siding, you still have to have a foundation that's designed by structural and civil engineers. Our next steps. Yes. Just curious, historically, I know with the, with the stucco and the foundation, you, they become unmovable, they become somewhat permanent. How often, how many, how many Portables, or what percentage of the portables have we moved around in RUS history? My predecessors moved uh, some portables. As the district really grew in the early 2000s, um, there was quite a bit of movement um, for Larry Stark and Sue Azilius. Um, and we have a binder of all the moves, and we, we have to track them where they move to another site for the, you know, let the state know where the buildings are being moved. Since I've been working for the district, we've had two projects where we've moved, relocated them from Antelope Creek and uh, Breen over to Whitney High School and Rockland High School. 
So since I've been here, I've had two projects. We've moved five portables in total. So Craig, I, you didn't mention the Hardy board as far as the siding. You mentioned the stucco and the T111, but it's the Hardy board at Quarry Trails, correct? And wasn't that what we were gonna use going forward? Correct, and that, that's an option <coughs> that um, for if you want the portable building or modular, um, it, the Hardy board is a concrete fiber product that um, has a better you know, life expectancy than wood because it's got the concrete base. And that's what we've, we've designed for the five portables that we're putting in Allen Quarry Trail and then the before and after school program portal that we put in last year. And would that be what we would go with moving forward? It's an option, yes. We wouldn't go back to the T111. That would be the recommendation. What's the cost difference between that and stucco? Between the hardy, hardy board, board, very minimal. Talking with the manufacturers. It's uh, as much as stucco or it's close to it's, it's, it's comparable to a T111 okay. siding. So they're uh, just switching out the T111 for hardy backer. Yes. And, and talking with the manufacturers, they, they said it's, it's minimal cost. It wouldn't even impact the overall cost of the building. One of the other kind of preference. And, then, and, then, and they're moving towards just installing those now for longevity. Okay, and then what I really want to, um, I don't know, push back a little bit on is the dirt foundation with the, or the dirt um, ground with the wood foundations. If, isn't it true if we put, I mean, I know you said we have to listen to our, our engineers and everything, I agree with that obviously, but um, isn't it possible to request some coating on the dirt, gravel, or something that separates the organic material from the building? And isn't it also possible to ask for um, aluminum rather than treated wood for lifespan so that they, because wood rots and aluminum doesn't rot or rust, right? So wouldn't it increase the lifespan of the portables? So let me just kind of walk through the process. Um, these, these buildings are, are pre-approved buildings through the state. That's uh, if you go with the portable building and that's how come we can get a quicker timeline. What that means is that portable, portable manufacturer has to work with the state to meet the, the state guidelines on how to build this, this type of building. And we, we, when we decide to go with a project and say, well, hey, we want to like at Quarry Trail, first step is to hire the architect. We hire the architect and say, this is what we're looking for and this is the type of building we're looking for. They go to their structural engineers and civil engineers, and they come up with the, the set of plans along with the portable manufacturer's approved set of plans. They have to put their site plans together and submit them together to the state so we can get approval um, for the project. In that process, whatever they come back with from the licensed engineers, uh, and same with the architects, we have to follow those, those guidelines, if that makes sense. So the, the only part that of the building that's sitting on the dirt is the wood foundations. There's an 18 inch clearance. Right, but if dirt. it's wood, isn't that the part that rots? I mean, isn't that the part we want to keep if you're putting two organics together? Even if the wood's treated, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be better to go with aluminum? Well, one or the other at least. Uh, it, it, it's, it's something that is, is that comes from the structural engineer. You, can't you request it though? Can't you give direction for that? I cannot. Because the licensed engineer, we have to follow whatever their requirements come back to the district, and, and, and not to the district, but through the state. So as an owner's rep for the district, I can't tell an architect how to design and get these areas approved. And for the liability of the district, we have to follow those guidelines from the architect and the engineers and from the DSA approved plans. It, it's my job to make sure that the, the projects are built to those specs and requirements from the state. And that's why we hire an inspector of record that works for the state, hired through the district. He also makes sure that, that you know, when the project is built, that every detail on those plans is followed along with the specifications um, are, are met throughout the duration of the project. So that would mean it's not being done anywhere? Uh, not that I'm aware, not that I'm aware. Um, as long as I've been doing this, I, we've, I've always followed the approved plans, um, and we just we we build to what they tell us to build. 
it's, it's not the other way around. They don't build what we tell them to build. It, uh, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Right. And, and I go back to the liability. If, if I deviated one portion of the approved plans, I expose the district to some liability concerns because we, we built it not for the approved state of plans. And then we have a, uh, the inspector of record. He wouldn't let us build it like that. So what he, he also has to report to the state, and we have this, the state representative for our area who he works for comes out and they approve our projects and they make sure that it's being built to the requirements of DSA. Uh, so there, there's a couple layers of approval process. So in, if, I, if I may just to uh, try to assist, assist is, um, I, I have, I trust, Trustee Hap, I absolutely hear your interest of saying, well, is the person writing the check, we, we'd like to be able to request certain things be considered by the architects, by the engineers, as they develop their recommendations. And I, and I appreciate you saying, I understand we need to follow, you know, because they're the certified professionals that we have to follow, but it doesn't prohibit us from making a request that they see if they can include that in the, their work and design. And, and, and so that we're making known as the, as the purchasers what we'd like. Um, but, you know, and asking them to consider that as they do that work. However, knowing that if they come back and say for these reasons it can't, that, that we understand that because they're clearly not going to put their stamp or certification on a plan that it is not, because they don't want the liability professionally, we don't want it. But I, so I also hear, what I hear your request is to make known what we would like, but understanding that, you know, we'll, we'll look at what they is in their professional capacity recommend versus we just kind of get whatever they give us. Does that seem to be yes, the interest? Yes, thank you. I would like to make that request that we at least look into and request one or the other, if not both, as far as organic to organic. If we can have one of those traded out for non-organic, that I would like to make that request. And, and Roger, I appreciate that. Because this, <laughs> this, this is part of the programming portion of the project. So when we come in and we we have a project that is, is now developed and moving forward. This is this is the type of building we're looking for. This is what we want on the building. Do, do we want a pitch roof? Do we want skylights? Do we want stucco? Then we could ask that, that question. I apologize for not getting to that point. So I appreciate the, the help on that. But but yeah, and then what will happen is that they'll come back and say, well, you know, because of this, this, and this, we can't do that. This is what we have to put in there. Okay. And follow can these I, guidelines. Or I, maybe they'll say yes. <laughs> Can I just, I would like to add some thoughts. I, personally, I, my hope, I know that we have a timeline for trying to get started on some of these things. I know we've talked about a lot of options. I would hope that maybe we could, you know, it sounds like we're not maybe going to be able to have an answer tonight, but I, I, I think we have to really know that this is something that needs, I think we have a responsibility to make a decision here my opinion on the options, I get concerned with the amount of cost for these buildings and the amount of need and that we want them to last as long as they possibly can. I worry about making modifications outside of the way that the builder, you know, recommends. So the weight of the stucco that is heavier, that concerns me because will that come with unforeseen issues down the road? Um, skylights, that also concerns me, just with ideas of as they get older in age, will they leak, will there be issues? I think our other classrooms don't tend to have those. I would say that's a risk that I would not want to take. The pitched roof, I'm, I mean, that, that probably looks nice. Like, I'm, that seems like to me the, the least, you know, like something that might be a good addition to our campuses, but even though we don't move many portables, that is one of the benefits of doing portables and to remove that and add cost and add weight where it isn't intended to be. I have concerns on that. Um, you know, also thinking about just that these portables are going to a variety of sites and they do last for many years. Being able to move them knowing that we're reaching build out our school populations may change. We may need those buildings somewhere else in 20 years. Like, we don't know. So I think it would be good to leave the option open to use the newer, more aesthetically pleasing part
party board that we've seen at Cory Trail, um, and maybe talk about the pitched roof. I don't, you didn't add a, a picture on that. That would be where, where I'm at with these kind of aesthetic pieces and just my concern on our timeline. I agree. I think we're going to be ready to, I mean, we have appreciate the time you guys have taken on this. Um, I, I did want to speak to, because I went with Greg to Antelope and we looked at the portables there. Um, the skylights actually made a huge different difference for a minimal cost. Um, I'll let you, you know, you can speak to what their representative said about how long they're lasting. They haven't had any problems. I know that we did talk to them about that. Um, I like the idea of the gable um, pitched roof to match. Um, I, 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 one of my cons to how the portables look is if they really stuck out as sore thumbs on campuses, right? So if that makes um, a difference, that's a minimal cost. I'm, I'm concerned also with the 100,000 on every portable. Um, are there some portables? I, I just don't understand why it would have to be on all of them. Could you, could um, you assess? This is definitely, you know, some one of the schools. If you go back a slide, had thirteen portables on its campus. Uh, maybe keep going back. Sorry, when you had them prioritized by campus, it's probably like the second slide in. Yeah. So Antelope Creek, for example, that has thirteen portables. You know, are ten of those? for sure going to be permanent, and maybe we have those be stucco. I'm not sure, but I trust that you'll make the best decision. I just don't know if it needs to be on, um, if the stucco needs to be on all of them. I do understand that it really, really helps them last longer, but then, as you're saying, we lose some of the advantage of them being able to be movable. Um, and then, did, did you, can you talk a little bit about the, um, the maintenance, is there any maintenance with stucco? Yes. Okay, what and is that? You, with, with stucco, you know, just like everything else, as it settles, it starts to crack. True. As the buildings settle. Mm -hmm. And over time, you, you have to get on a maintenance plan to paint right. these buildings. And we, you know, as it, I repainted some of the buildings at Whitney High School, the front of those, you know, the three front buildings, we use an elastomeric paint, mm -hmm. and that helps take care of those, uh, seal the cracks, yeah. and give it a longer longevity. So it has just has to get on a maintenance plan. Okay. Um, every every you know, five to eight years, you're painting buildings. Um, budget if your budget allows you to do that. Yeah. Do you feel like it would be not pleasing if you know out of thirteen, some were stucco and some were hardy board? Do you think that that would not look good? I'll, I'll, I want your honest opinion. I see your smile. <laughs> I, I can say that the products that are coming out now with the hardy plank look more like the. They don't look like the, the old T111 siding. Okay. It looks more of a, of a lighter pattern mm -hmm. and more towards, not a stucco pattern, but not the T111. Do you, what do you think the difference is in longevity? Between... Hardy well, board. Hardy board has the same type of concrete fiber. Stucco is concrete with the mix. And the difference between the T11 and the hardy board? I'm sorry? The, the difference between the T11 and the hardy board in longevity? One's a wood, one's a wood product. And one is the concrete fiber. Is so it double? Is it? Oh, the cost? Yeah. No, how oh, long they'll last. Long, longevity? Well, um, if you maintain wood siding, you paint it, keep right. the sprinklers off of it, and um, you know, it, you'll, you'll get the maximum longevity out of it. Um, I think that with any product, if it's not properly maintained, it will fail over time. But of course, wood has more of a tendency to go quicker than a, a hardy plank or, or stucco. And then also you have to think about the, where the, the way the buildings are faced. Your right. southern face buildings yeah. and so, southeastern get a lot of weather, but the heat in the summer and then the, the driving rains. Um, even with the stucco, we still have water penetrations over time. It's yeah. just because of that driving rain just takes a beating on them. But on our portables, that is what is the most, requires the most maintenance is the outside siding. On those on the southeastern, southeast, well, south, okay. south and east side of the building, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, western, southwestern, yeah. I think some of the concern for me would be centered around the students' experience and the teachers' experience inside the portable. Um, do any of these improvements you feel change that for the students? Um, did you hear anything about, you know, because uh, I hear you on concerns about skylight, thing like that. Maintenance is very important to me, the money that we're putting down, but also as far as do any of these change HVAC? Do any of these change any of the actual experience inside the room? No, because each classroom will have the same finishes for our educational specifications. 
So whether whatever we're doing on the outside, you're still gonna have the same flooring, the same cabinets on wheels, the same flexible furniture, the same whiteboards on the two walls. That's our standard classroom now when we as going forward. But I think also when you and I went into Antelope, those portables don't feel like um, a hollow floor. You know, they felt like a, a, like oh. you were on the ground, they were solid. You were so in a regular right. classroom. So newer, yeah. right? That's good. I feel like, yeah. so, I feel like, like they've improved. Right? Like the newer ones yeah. that we have. Yeah. Correct. Okay. If, you, if, if you walked into the science buildings that we put over uh, uh, the annex at Rockland High School, and then the, you know, the new building we put over at uh, uh, Cory Trail, if you walk in there, it's a different feel. It's, it's, a, it's a stiffer floor. It's just the way that they have come, you know, progressed over the years in the design. And um, the type of floor joists, it's, it's, it, I don't want to get into all the engineering yeah. specs, but yeah. it's a much better built construction building. Yeah. And as far as like HVAC output, as far as maintenance um, with the concrete siding or the hardy board, does it make a difference to you? No difference. Okay, and as far as it being trapping in the heat, sorry, I'm just double checking because our environment gets quite hot. No, no, I and a lot of the complaints I get is when our HVACs are out. And so I, I, to me, that's really concerning to me. That would really change things for me if you felt that one would hinder that over another. It, it would have no impact, whether it, it was it, stucco or siding. The, the HVAC unit itself is a separate. And, and the other interest we'd heard was the older portables that this would replace, the, the ramps and all of that. This has the, it oh, has. Flush entry. The, the Flush entry, so that it, it, it the, even the entry feels like you're walking into a permanent built building, versus I'm going into a ramp, I'm going onto that, and, and so I, I think that from the from a distance, even in a sense, you would have trouble telling which is which because even the flush entry, which, which assists in that experience in the floor, and then the HVAC piece, you know, part of what you, the, we've, the the board's already given direction on is to include HVAC replacement because of the same issues you've mentioned on the climbs and lifts. I remember at Cory Trails, it was really costly for us to install that. Does that 31 million include installation? Of the, of the portables? Correct. It does, okay. So let me think, make sure I understand the question. So the $31 million um, covers the 32 portables for the, the site work, the demolition, and the new buildings. And the installation of them, the yes. whole thing started yeah, to yes, finish. Perfect, yeah. thank you. I, I also want to emphasize these are estimates, um, and when we you know, put out on the street for the actual contracts, the actual prices will vary just because they will. So these are our estimates with today's dollars, but as we, we go out and, and put this on the street, uh, they may may change. Uh, my guess is they may be more, just as inflation is more. So we just want the board to understand that too. That the actual number may may change. You know, we hope not by more than one or two, but but they could just based on actual numbers, sure. because the project delivery we're asking board approval, and we estimate it'll take us uh, approximately you know anywhere from four to five years to deliver all the projects with the HVAC, the portables, and all that. So just just want to make sure anybody listening, if they say, well, on April 17th, we saw that number, we didn't include the word estimate, and, and just really want to emphasize that. So. Yeah. Could you go back to the slide that has the um, budget on, yeah, thank you. So all the options are without the options. Keep going with the options. Although um, I was initially um, uncomfortable with this, I feel like with our current budget situation, the difference in the number of classrooms that we can get, 34 versus, is it 15? I'm sorry. Yeah. 34 versus 15, versus you know, 32 versus 13. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable with the portable classrooms um, moving forward with those. I'm happy to make a motion when you're ready. I actually just wanted to comment on that as well because I was also one of the ones who was very uncomfortable with doing portables instead of um, building classrooms. But after doing a lot of research and asking a lot of questions and going and, and seeing them for myself, I too have become much more comfortable with um, the portables. I do still want you to check into what we talked about um, just because one of the one of my holdups with portables is their lifespan, and I want to make sure that we get the longest life that we can. Um, but I'm I'm ready to move in that direction. 
think I'm hearing a motion to approve the inclusion of portable classrooms in our FMP. Is there a formal motion anyone would like to make? Um, May I clarify? Yeah. Just, just is is that the um, without any enhancements, or was there a, a request to include the gabled pitched roofs as well? Just want to clarify as we, we go out to work. Yes, I would request the pitched roofs and the um, skylights and the hardy board. I think there was a request. If you could go back to the slide that shows those options, perfect. Just to clarify, the Hardy Board's included in the initial cost, correct? Yes. So when it says estimated cost for portable includes soft costs, it's in that column. It's not in the concrete foundations on, one. It's in the... Um, on slide 20. No, on slide 19. So if you look That's at the estimated cost for portable, uh, 887000 that includes a Hardy plank, the Hardy Board siding. Okay, perfect. So really the question comes into play is the gable pitched roof and the skylights. Which and the are exterior minimal wall. cost. It's the stucco that was the very, very large cost. But yeah, the, I, the gable I, pitch and, this, and the skylights are very minimal. Okay, I just yeah, wanted to clarify in the motion so we, we got it. Thank you. I'll, so everybody could hear me. I'm not hearing a request or desire, although I think we would like it, um, but a request or desire for the exterior wall stucco. But I am hearing that the FMP, this plan, includes gable pitched roofs and skylights because those are at a minimal cost. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so to clarify the motion, um, actually, I'll have the individual that made the motion. If you could clarify that motion. No, I don't think anybody made the motion yet. No, no one's made a motion. I like it. I will motion <laughs> that we add these to um, the FMP, including the gable pitch roofs and the skylights. Second. To the portable classroom option. Yes. Excellent. Okay, hearing a first and a second. First by Trustee Hupp, second by Trustee Price. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Julie Hupp? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentation this evening. Yes, thank you very much for all of your work. Okay, we'll now move on to item 11.1. .1. We ask Hannah Anderson, our Director of Innovation, School Programs, and Accountability, to join us in presenting the Local Control and Accountability Plan. Good evening, President Sadoff, trustees, and Superintendent Stock in a minute. <laughs> I'm here tonight to share about uh, our, an update on our local control and accountability plan and the planning process for the um, 24 through 27 school year, three-year plan. During the presentation tonight, I will share um, about the proposed draft goals and actions. I'm specifically sharing about services we're looking at within each uh, LCAP goal and share the roadmap um, overarching ideas developed through the community schools grant planning team and increased services we're planning for English learner students. We'll also uh, have an opportunity to discuss next steps. These draft goals were shared with trustees in February at the mid-year update of the LCAP. These were then shared with our staff advisory committee and uh, parent guardian advisory committee for review. Uh, there were no changes after those uh, discussions. Both of those committees felt strongly that these uh, goals addressed our needs. And uh, as you heard uh, Travis share earlier, these were also uh, brought to labor management and, and then discussed how they can be used to help um, in that work as well. Much of what you see on this slide was shared also at the February 7th presentation. What I want to uh, highlight here tonight is what's in the box on the right-hand side. So as um, you have seen in previous years, the left-hand side actually talks about what are the data sets um, that caused us to 
have this goal or a very small portion of those data sets, what have the past three-year teams shared about this uh, goal area in a really high-level way? And then the right hand inside the box there is showing what have this year's teams said about goal one, um, our efforts in math improvement. So there's a continued need specifically at the elementary level for increased training in curricular, curriculum and instructional strategies in mathematics. Teachers uh, are getting together soon to discuss their professional development needs and more specifics, but the intention um, with this bullet point is to highlight the specific needs of our students with unique learning needs, our English learner students, our students with disabilities, and making sure that we're meeting their needs not in the pullout classroom, but in their general education classroom where the majority of their instruction is taking place. So that's been the, the interest. Um, staff also have reported the need for vertical articulation, so to better understand what's happening in the grade levels prior to their grade level and how will students' needs be met in the next grade level. So that's been an interest raised. There have also been um, both parents and staff um, the continued need to close gaps early for students, so really investing in that early intervention. We know specifically related to math achievement that if we are waiting until high school to try to close gaps, it's phenomenally difficult um, to close gaps as well as ensure that students are passing courses and meeting A through G requirements to have all of their options open for them if that's the path they choose. Um, our secondary staff and parents also report the need to continue those everyday math courses so that for students that need uh, that uh, doubled time in mathematics, that option is available to them. And then we'll be gathering more um, information on these services that are related to the action items when we take um, all of this information to our advisory committees next week. So they meet for the fourth time next week for two hours. All of the services that have uh, been in goal one will sustain in goal one, or we're looking at them sustaining in goal one next year. So a couple of highlights are their ongoing work um, that's taking place K-12 in terms of intervention and those um, ninth grade class size reduction, everyday math sections will sustain um, our program specialists. Uh, I'll talk in a minute about targeted tutoring and, and how we have some um, attempts to make change there. We also have ongoing work related to our data analysis and helping ensure that um, teachers have training in our analytics tool and also what is that, how can they use that to drive instruction in their classroom and best support students' needs? And then shared about the professional development a minute ago. Could, These expanded could, services, oh, sorry, absolutely. Sorry, quick question. Um, I know that Everyday Math, we did that wrong. Do that both, we did it at both the high schools? Yes, both okay. high schools have six additional sections offered through one-time funding. Um, to uh, ensure that they can each offer a whole teacher's worth of everyday math classes. When does that one-time funding expire? I mean, what does it go to? When that one-time funding um, in the one-time spending plan, which also includes all of these expanded services on this slide, the one-time funding goes through the 24-25 school year. So okay. these services will be in place next year. And then there are some um, additional funds that are set aside either through supplemental funding ongoing or general fund ongoing that we'll need to discuss in next year's process. And I think the intent of including them in the LCAP is that we found them to be successful. And so we want them to be able to be continued if possible. And so by including them in the LCAP, it allows us to utilize dollars to keep them in existence, correct? That is a one of the pieces that we have tried to do in Rockland that is, um, not, not just unique to Rockland, but not all districts in the state of California do this, but we are trying to and have tried to align the one-time dollars we received from the state to be in alignment through, for, for COVID relief, to be in alignment to our LCAP, to really invest in, if we believe these are three goals that are going to increase and improve services for students here in Rockland, how can we utilize these one-time dollars to um, enhance the services and deepen the services that we're offering within our goal areas. The, the only thing I was going to add was the everyday math, it, it is six additional uh, uh, sections. That's not all the everyday math offered. That's additional because our, our high schools are invested in that and we're offering everyday math even before COVID, even before this. So it's, so it's, an, it's even more. So, so if it, all the money were to go away, um, there would still be everyday math. It just wouldn't be to the degree that this extra provides. 
we also have um, uh, historically offered some of everyday mass sections, or at least for the last five years, we've been able to offer everyday mass sections through our supplemental funding as well. So that that is um, also uh, what you'll see here actually in the May presentation, we'll share the expenditures and then more specifically at the public hearing in June where you'll have an opportunity to see these are the federal funds that are gonna support this, these are the supplemental funds, and here are the general funds that are supporting this action. These ongoing services um, are also continuing to be expanded. Here's another um, space. You can see the last bullet point is for expanded summer school. Um, that is actually through our expanded learning opportunities program funding we received from the state of California that we had the opportunity to expand summer school. Whereas before that funding came in, we had that service at the elementary level for our um, students at our Title I schools. This program actually was a, a reduction at one point due to budget cuts, and then because of this specialized funding source, we now are able to expand this service and ensure that um, students at any of our elementary schools who have an um, identified need, um, the, basically the, the neediest 250 students, um, gain first access to this expanded program during the summer. We're looking, we'll be looking at a couple of service augmentations, a couple of new um, or revised actions that the committees will look at next week um, and give their input on. One of them is that, um, and I think uh, President Sadoff, um, you shared this at the February 7th board meeting that the targeted tutoring, we haven't had as much success with our targeted tutoring programs. We've tried many different options uh, over the last number of years of how we might offer this through virtual options, our own staff, partnering with agencies, using peer tutors. And different years we've had different levels of success with, um, with our tutoring programs. Where What we have not explored to a great extent is partnering with third party local agencies to help us in offering tutoring. And so that is one of our coordinators of expanded learning is actually looking into this currently is how can we partner with community-based organizations and then lean into um, our students potentially and other, um, and other um, local colleges to help us in our tutoring efforts. So I hope to be able to bring back more information on our progress in this area at the May presentation, but that's um, that action item. And then there's also an interest in thinking about um, our opportunities for professional development, specifically helping uh, understand that conceptual progression in mathematics, and I know Director Davidson, when she comes back to do her next math improvement update, will we'll share about how we um, help teachers, especially general educators at the elementary level, truly understand the progression of conceptual understanding at the early ages so that they can better help um, students when they're getting stuck in a particular um, area. We're identifying for example, fractions at fourth and fifth grade as being a major sticking point. So really ensuring that our teachers understand that conceptual progression and they can help their students push past those stuck points, for lack of a better term. And then there's also an interest in thinking about our professional learning communities, so our teams of teachers and how they can use data to inform their instruction in their classroom. So moving on to goal two, uh, again, the left hand um, is data you've seen before. However, I don't know that I highlighted this to the greatest extent um, as I could have when I was here in March. So I want to call out the third bullet point on the left-hand side of this slide is that our five-year uh, data on our California Healthy Kids is showing progress or stabilization in, the, in students who have suicidal ideation as you um, have put a great amount of resources into thinking about how do we meet the mental health needs of students. Um, I think all of us firmly believe that any number above 0% of students having suicidal ideation is too high, but I, I do think that we can solidly say we are showing progress um, and some stabilization in this area, which is very important to all of us. The right-hand side, um, these are the input we've received this year on this goal, and you had the opportunity to hear from students earlier in the year on this. But staff do report the need to sustain the social, emotional, mental health, and behavioral personnel and resources. Our parents and staff continue to report the need for clear communication regarding access and referral processes for services. You'll see that in the next coming slides. Our staff also report the need for ongoing training, especially to support students who have those highest behavioral needs and the highest um, social, emotional needs. 
And lastly, uh, this has come out of the staff committee, but they're, um, they're reporting the need to have consistency in PBIS systems across the district. We have many schools that um, are highly effective in their PBIS practices, and many that have had a lot of st stops and starts um, with their implementation. Maybe it's because they've had turnover on their PBIS teams in terms of who's their, who are their leaders. Maybe they've had leadership turnover at their school. So we're working to identify which of our sites could benefit from a little extra support in this area and maybe um, thinking about getting them a, a more in-depth training sequence again. So more to be um, identified in this area, but there is, an, there is an interest to make sure that all staff and students have access to a consistently implemented PBIS system at the elementary level. We are looking to continue similar services that have been uh, ongoing the last few years in uh, the goal two area, specifically uh, highlighting here our partnerships um, with Wellness Together to offer secondary um, mental health uh, um, support to our seventh through 12th grade students, ensuring that we um, continue our K through 12 counseling program. I think um, this was also shared at the workshop, but just what a resounding um, benefit it is to have one elementary counselor for every two schools. Uh, and so there is a great interest in keeping that. Also looking to enhance the way that our PBIS systems at both the elementary and middle school can integrate with our social emotional learning. So it's not like it's two separate initiatives, but rather one framework that's being implemented on our campuses. And then just um, sliding down to the last bullet point, just to highlight that there's an interest in continuing our family education series. We do want to refine and think about this series on how do we, it's great, it's a great investment of time, energy, resources to put this series together. Some of the um, workshops have been highly attended and some of the workshops we've had six to 10 um, uh, parent, guardian participants, sometimes more presenters than people from the community who were able to attend. And so I think it's important to, that we think about, you know, our, we've tried a few different models. Some of them, again, have been highly attended. So it's just something we need to reflect on and think about how do we make sure that we, um, that we get the right messages out there and that we also identify the right topics to discuss so that we um, have high attendance at these nights. I know that can be really frustrating, but I hope you know that we still really appreciate your efforts and trying to figure out what, what people's needs are and what works for them. I appreciate all that you've done. I'm not gonna take any of the credit there. That is solely on uh, uh, Katie Twelridge, our coordinator of expanded learning, Danielle Martling, one of our math coaches, and Beth Davidson. They work, um, and Sandeep, in, in the communication efforts there. So it's been a joint effort across departments to ensure that we have um, this series. So expanded services in goal two. Uh, we are looking to um, continue and enhance in a couple of areas for expanded um, services for social, emotional, behavioral, um, and mental health supports. We want to sustain our increased behavior analyst staffing. We now have three behavior analyst positions. So we'll sustain that third position to support students with highest needs behaviors um, and ensure each campus um, uh, Leslie Holmes and Beth Davidson have been working on um, training two schools in a pilot behavior response team. This is something we actually started pre-COVID, but with the addition of a third behavior analyst and some of our behavior support assistants, as well as counselors and psychologists at our staffs, we can train up a behavior response team that um, can be available when students are in crisis and when teachers need support. So that has been a pilot that has been tried this year. Um, our instructional um, coach in, in, um, in a psychologist position has also been leading up that work and supporting that team and getting going. So that will continue. We also have um, a sustained, um, we will sustain our mental health specialist, which PCOE um, provides to us. We used to um, participate in a partial of that grant funding, but now they have a grant that they've passed through to us to ensure that we still have access um, to our most vulnerable students at Victory High School to ensure that their mental health needs are being met. And then we also have, um, we will maintain increased staffing one section per high school um, to support ensuring that our 
social emotional learning at the high school level is a contextual fit for each school. So I think we heard the first year when we just used this set curriculum that that wasn't exactly what students needed and so now each school has one teacher who's dedicating one section to uh, think about what is the best way to integrate social emotional learning on our campuses that meets our campus culture. They train the rest of their staff to um, implement these lessons in, on the campus. That model was used this year and it's been much better than what we've seen um, in previous years. <clears throat> And then a couple of augmentations we're looking at and we'll be working with the team next week, both teams next week on, is to think about how we can enhance our bully prevention education by adding instructional lessons to address instances of harassment and hate speech and ensuring staff and students receive training in strategies to address bullying and hate speech. So as we identified this as a need and brought this to you in February, um, thank you to trustee Sutherland and um, President Sadoff for meeting um, with education services staff and thinking through what the needs are in this area. This is, this is an action that we are looking at. We wanna make sure that we run this by um, our advisory committees and get their input as well on how we best um, will implement this. But we're thinking about much in the same way as we think about how do we teach the rules of school at the beginning of the um, school year and how do we teach about um, online safety and being a good digital citizen. Um, we have bully prevention lessons at some grade levels, not all grade levels, so really wanting to make sure that we have a consistent approach to um, bully prevention education that also um, very specifically addresses harassment and hate speech at an age appropriate, in an age appropriate way um, um, that ensures that all students are free from harassment and hate speech on our campuses. We also are exploring a consistent referral process for students to access behavioral and mental health interventions and supports. So you've seen for a few uh, years now that there is a need to communicate better about the services that we have in this area. And even through increased communication efforts, that need continues to arise. And so this is our way of altering that to say, if we have more consistency in the way that students are referred to interventions, then we can even be helpful at a district level of communicating what we have because it's not different across all of our schools. So if we can develop a consistent uh, referral process and we can advertise to staff and families how they can access the services on our campus. This third bullet point is to um, look at our, our greatest, um, one of our greatest needs uh, in terms of our suspension rate is related to substance use and abuse. And so we'll be increasing, uh, looking to increase the number of substance use prevention and abuse resources and interventions on our secondary campuses to ensure that students, um, when a consequence is necessary, students have a consequence, but we also wanna make sure that we're supporting them and educating them um, and providing um, or partnering um, for treatment when necessary. The last here is looking at our sustained investment in Care Solace. We, um, we appreciate this resource and we wanna hear from our committees how it is working. Um, we've had a mixed result and heard from some of our families recently that um, they're not having as fast of access to services as we originally thought. Much of that that, that our families would receive much of that is because services in all areas, um, but definitely here in Placer County are overextended and there it just aren't as many services to come by. And so the original promise of we'll help families get uh, uh, with a provider within two weeks, that's not coming to fruition because that's not a possibility in our area. And so we want to think about, is this still a, an investment that we want to make or are there other ways um, of doing this. So that's something we're gonna be working with our committees on. We also have, um, uh, through the work of Julie Kessler, who's here uh, this evening, our program specialist of community schools and integrated supports, she has led uh, a team of 36 team members, including two trustees. They have met over 16 hours between September to uh, February. Um, it, this was a represented, representation of all of our secondary schools to think about what you are hearing about in goal two. So really this team took a deep dive into 
We have many social, emotional, mental health, and behavioral needs at our secondary schools, and those needs seem to be increasing, and we keep adding services, but we're not yet meeting that target of addressing all of the needs. And so we wanted to pull together a representative team, and through that community schools planning grant, we were able to pull together the 36 uh, members representing all schools. We had parents on this committee, amazing students on this committee that were um, vocal and, and helpful with how we can do differently on our campuses to try to address this need. Um, we also had administrators, teachers, classified staff members, special education representatives, and community partners through um, Placer County Office of Education and the, um, and the Placer County System of Care on this team. So it was a representative team of our community. And um, they also went on four site visits um, to think about what this could look like. And let's think a little bit out of the box and learn from each other. And so through the work of this team, they identified a variety of needs and brainstormed ways that we could uh, address those needs. They used a continuous um, improvement process. And so this slide does not at all do their great work justice um, to pull all of their um, planning into three. But I wanted to just highlight um, three of the ideas that were shared by the team um, that we will be looking um, to, to find contextual fit at each uh, school, and I'll talk more about that um, here in a minute, but the top three were, um, or the three big ideas, were to increase student connectedness through the creation of student hubs or student union spaces on campuses. So one of the major themes that came out of this group was to think about how can we support student-to-student -student connection and student-to-trusted adult connection on campus, because we're hearing from our students that they want and, and need that connection and sometimes need adults to facilitate that connection. And so there was also this interest from the team in, um, in not just thinking about goal two like it's mental health supports or it's behavioral supports, but really it's this whole child approach of um, how can um, we get students involved in clubs? How can we get students connected to peer tutors? How can we get students connected to the campus? And so this idea of kind of almost you think about like a college student union and it's the hub of the campus and people, they were joking, but you know, you come there and you come and you have a coffee with your friend and you play a game with your friend and you sit quietly and you're able to read. And so this idea started emerging of what could a hub space look like on our secondary campuses. So that was of interest to the committee. There was also interest to develop a multidisciplinary site-based team to help with that identification, referral process, and progress monitoring of student needs at the tier two and tier three um, level for both social, emotional, and mental health support. So this, um, this team would be able to refer students to on-campus interventions, and then of course, if students um, were um, selected to or referred to participate in an intervention, um, parent permission would be garnered at that point. And then there would be improved, um, they also wanted to see improved communication between uh, educational partners by building awareness of the available resources and then having a regular feedback loop from students and staff to help inform decision making on the campus. So the idea with next steps here is there's, um, there will be some no cost and low cost and then others that um, options that come out of this team to help us in this goal two area. Um, but some very exciting um, work, and again, many, uh, th there's a lot more to share, but these were just those top three highlighted ideas. What did our grant cover of that? So the, the grant was a planning grant that um, was to bring all of these folks together. So it paid for the off-campus site visits, it paid for the extra hours of um, folks to participate in the committee itself. It also um, went to the salary of our program specialist to lead that work. And then there, that the outcome of this is also to put together a roadmap that has the low no cost option. So what can we implement if we don't get a community schools grant um, or try to implement through other funding sources? And then there's a, an additional piece of, um, and, and Julie has spent a significant amount of time writing then the actual 
community schools implementation grants. So it would be, um, those are written by school site. So in February, I believe, February, we submitted five grants, um, grant applications to the state of California for the community schools implementation grant. Those are by school site. So, um, and then if we receive um, one, two, or five grants, then we have to work with school-based teams to implement those grants. So even though we write an implementation plan and we include it in the grant, we would then create a smaller planning team at that school site because the whole idea is that that school community identifies what that school community needs and works taking the framework that was developed by this uh, multidisciplinary and wide-spanning team, but works very specifically with that group. I guess what I can also say is community schools is a huge thing, and what Rockland was looking to do was a slice of it that was a good contextual fit for Rockland, and that we could get really excited about, and I think the planning team members, and I'm sure um, trustees can share this, but the planning team members were very excited about the outcome um, that was developed. When do you find out if you get those grants? We're told end of April, early May. Maybe, Maybe soon. soon. The five schools that submitted grant applications are? All of our secondary schools. So our two middle okay. schools and our three high schools. Thanks. I will say that these are very competitive grants. Um, we, uh, we didn't have a lot of qualifying factors for the qualifying um, demographics that they might be looking for in those grant applications in terms of our socioeconomic status. However, there were some factors that did make us eligible, including suspension rates. And so it was important to us to capitalize on the opportunity um, and That's apply. Inside of goal three, um, as you know, this is everything else that makes Rockland Unified shine. And so there's a couple of um, highlighted changes I can bring to you. Um, a few of them are just continuations, such as continuing to expand TK and continuing to sustain air, um, credit recovery courses. We also are looking to um, build upon the pilot that was started this year with the early phonics phonemic awareness work around science of reading methodologies, and so that will be expanded in the coming years to ensure um, that we're meeting more students' needs at the K-1 level. And um, it, so far in the pilot schools, we're seeing great results. Um, many more students leaving our um, early grades on uh, grade level and on target with their uh, reading development. The fourth bullet point here um, identifies that we're going to continue doing work uh, related to attendance improvement. We'll be bringing our attendance work group back together um, in some format to think about what is the specific plan that will be implemented next year to build upon this year's attendance improvement. And then also um, continuing um, to maintain and strengthen the work that's happening in special education regarding curriculum um, implementation and, and differentiating our instruction to meet the needs of all learners. This slide highlights the program enhancements specifically for our English learner students. And so we are uh, increasing the number of uh, English language development staff members that we have. Um, in February, I shared that we have an increasing population of English learner students and also an increasing need in this area. And so we needed to add some staff um, to make sure that uh, we have enough um, staff to address the needs of this um, growing population. We also will be providing on-site training. We've identified that some of our schools with growing and higher numbers of English learner students appreciate when we can come out and offer professional development right after school at their school sites um, to make sure that um, they have the tools in their tool belt to meet the needs of their newest um, uh, newcomer English learner students. We also um, are building into our English language development staff teachers that can come out and support um, and walk alongside classroom teachers who have brand new English learner students in their classroom and those students need additional support right in that moment. So just trying to think differently about how do we support our general educators in meeting the needs of this unique um, population of students. 
We also have increased available software and instructional materials. We are um, ensuring that all of our cluster teachers, so we try to group our English learner students together as we don't have very many. It's still a relatively small population when compared to the, um, the, the numbers in other districts in the state of California. So we cluster our students together. So we're really also able to identify, okay, it's this one teacher at this grade level at this school that needs the training. It may not be all teachers. So to narrow the scope of who needs that professional development. We also will continue our family liaison um, work meeting with our families new to our district and helping them navigate not just in-district programs, but also community-based programs and sports in the community. And it's just, those have been great uh, meetup sessions. We will um, continue to have priority access to our learning recovery programs, meaning that our English learner students get all of those um, services that you saw on the first slides in math improvement. They have access to those courses um, in some cases first, right? because they're, um, if that's the need that their school has identified for them, then they get enrolled in those courses and then those spots are taken and then it goes to the next group of students. So really wanting to make sure they have access to these classes and that they're not just provided access but scheduled into these classes as appropriate. And then at the elementary level working um, to ensure that our classroom teachers really understand what the levels of language acquisition are and where the students in their classroom fall so that the classroom teacher who the students spend the majority of their day with can help them progress to that next level. And that brings us to next steps. So we're going to continue implementing this year for the last weeks of the school year, working with our educational partners next week to finalize our draft. And that will be um, landing on what will be the metrics that aligned all of these new actions and services. And, um, and then what are some proposed expenditures? Uh, we will bring all of that information back to trustees on May 15th at the board meeting. And then um, we have the last five years, I believe, been utilizing continuous um, improvement feedback data from our advisory committees to inform how we can keep making that process better. We wanna make sure that when we're engaging our community, they actually feel engaged. Um, and that we can um, do better in this area. And so we take their feedback seriously, both staff and parents, and um, use it to inform the next meetings, which has been helpful. And then um, I will be back in June at two separate meetings, one for a public hearing to share the draft and then one for action at the end of the month. Are there any additional questions? Your advisory committees, that was the big parent group that you had. How many parents did you end up with most of your meetings? So uh, there were 80 families or, and parents that were selected to be part of the committee. And unfortunately, this year, we weren't able to take everyone who wanted to be on the committee. The last few years, we've been able to. And so yeah, I agree. Uh, and so um, we've had anywhere between uh, 45 to 55, 60 parents come. This happens each year where you start out with a larger group and then you know, throughout the year, there's sporting events, there's other things happening, so we definitely understand, but it's a solid group of people and um, their input has been very valuable. Thank you. Are there other committees that are also meeting as well that are advising the LCAP? Yes, so we also have our District English Learner Advisory Committee. That will be meeting at the beginning of May. We recently held our um, Homeless and Foster Youth Advisory Committee. I think I, that's maybe one I messaged about. <laughs> um, that that committee thinks about how do we increase and improve services specific to um, that population. And um, we will also have our staff professional development uh, um, advisory committee. That's also meeting here um, in a few weeks and their um, input also influences the LCAP because they're thinking about, okay, with all of these goals and actions, what training will staff need next year and over the course of the next three years to implement this plan um, and make these actions come to light. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the credit recovery classes, are those set up for all students or a specific subset of students? That is a great question and I'm, I believe, I'm gonna defer to Mr. Flowers, I can answer some of it, but I wanna make sure he's got the most up-to-date info. 
Yes, all students, what we found uh, with those three classes is if it's taught by a uh, credentialed teacher that understands, you know, if you need science recovery, a science teacher is assigned to that. Language arts, you know, math is special. We also have it for social studies. But both schools is doing that, and they do their best to have, you know, that single subject teacher in there because they're able to teach all those subjects, and they've found that to be uh, much more productive. And we have roughly three classes at each school, so Correct. a total of six. Correct. And are they using the Edgenuity software uh, to facilitate Correct. that? They are using that as credit recovery. But with our grading system, they can, they can um, specialize it to meet the kids. Uh, they're not necessarily <laughs> having to retake the entire class if they pass <laughs> a certain percentage of it. Correct. You can assign in that um, software program just those sections. Just want to say thank you. This is just such high quality work and so much effort and time and expertise has gone into this. Um, I was taking notes of all my favorite parts, but <laughs> I won't go through all that, but it's just, it's so great to see, you know, being that I've come to LCAP meetings for several years now, but looking at this kind of developed plan and seeing specific things that we hear parents and students talk about and here they are in a cohesive plan with, you know, strategies, um, you know, that hopefully even, even if, you know, we don't get all the funding that we want, we still have some ways that we can utilize um, what we've already put into place over the last couple of years and um, excited about the tutoring and looking for op um, options on that. I do think, you know, having counselors that are spend more time on each school site and they get to know the campus, get to know the students, you know, same with having the teachers, specific teachers that work on that social emotional piece. I think our students know when it's contrived and it's not authentic and they don't buy in. So, so that's just really excellent to see. Um, and, you know, the student union spaces, like we heard that from multiple students that we just don't have anywhere that we feel like we can go sit at lunch and, and be social. And so um, that um, professional development for the early phonics, I mean, the early reading is so important. And I just, you know, investing in our teachers is so valuable. So um, I appreciated that as well. Just overall, thank you so much. This looks great. You know, echoing some thanks, um, uh, pulling together, uh, not only first identifying uh, critical needs, but then pulling together ideas from throughout the entire district from so many different stakeholders. That's not an easy task. So um, I appreciate your work on that. I know we had the ability, Trustee Sutherland and myself, to really sit down um, and talk about some things um, that we saw from our California dashboard and some of our other uh, data collecting sites, such as the surveys. Um, that we were hoping would be included, and you, you included every single one of them. So I want to take a second and say thank you to that. Um, also, uh, really making clear by giving examples. Um, you know, sometimes uh, we can mean well as a district, but it can be a little confusing to parents that aren't used to LCAP language uh, to know what exactly does that phrase mean? When you say SEL, social, can you actually give me an example? Um, and I think that helps uh, to be able to talk together um, and understand exactly um, what resources we are having available and what things we aren't having on our campus that we might be thinking are happening on our campuses. Um, I, I do want to thank you specifically for calling out um, the English learner, learner um, supports. Um, you know, we've seen that population group grow, and so I, um, we also saw some concerns on our dashboard with that. So I thank you for saying, hey, we really need to, to look at that and highlight that, and, and the tutoring services as well, finding what will work uh, to get the students to access them and actually utilize those services. Um, I, I will say, um, uh, I was just wondering a little more information, um, student hubs and student unions, I'm intrigued by that. Um, what does that actually look like on a campus? I know there was two other trustees that sat on that community meeting or that advisory committee. I wasn't on that specific committee. Um, can you talk me through what a few examples of that would be? Sure. So one, this, um, this idea was really brought back through one of the site visits because the, the need had been identified in the committee of opportunities for student connection, um, creating spaces on campus where a variety of needs could be met, um, and then also creating um, those opportunities for student-to-student -student and student-to-staff connection. And so 
um, one of the visits uh, was of a school in the Bay Area, um, and the staff had actually identified, the counseling staff at that school had identified that there was interest in kind of rethinking the way that they offered services to students um, and not making it all based out of the office. So not to say this is what we would do here, because again, we would need to identify what does that look like in Rockland, but the idea was that they actually transformed their library space and they made it where there was still, there was a book area where obviously, you know, it is still a library where they could go and access materials, but they also had a um, counselor that was available for academic um, counseling and uh, just a calm down space. They had an uh, area in that there where their peer tutoring center was run out of. They had areas where students could just gather and be together and just have a safe space if they were a student that didn't have that group that they went out to find at lunchtime or that, that um, nutritional break time. They were able to go and access um, this area. So the, I think that the sky is the limit on what we would want this to be and each school um, site um, would need to work with teachers, counselors, parents, students to really identify and create what did they want in their hub spaces. It, was, it could also be a space where we say our third um, party provider of working with Wellness Together and all of that is done through the formal MOU process and parent permission process. That could be um, also in this space. So it's sort of a one stop space on campus where you can get and of everything that's happening in goal two and that some of what's happening in goal one, get those needs met in this hub space. The committee even tossed around crazy ideas like games and, you know, shuffleboard. <laughs> they had a good time dreaming. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love the, 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 the creativity. Um, are these, so this is different than clubs. So these are not necessarily topic specific. Um, I, I'm hearing these are not clubs. This is identifying locations that students can go to increase their connectedness with each other yes. or with the school. And connectedness to adults. So there was great interest on saying one of the things that's actually written into were we to receive one of the grants is that there was interest in different um, teachers at different um, that were interested in having release periods and doing work with students on building connections and supporting them with their academic learning and supporting them with their five-year plans and that, that those students could actually go and access um, trusted adults and teachers um, during the school day um, that could help them kind of and, and guide them with questions or other connections. So that the interest really started, I think, with one of our parents of being very vocal about wanting to ensure that our community um, schools committee wasn't just looking narrowly at mental health, but had a very broad focus on student to student connectivity, some of which could be met through sports and clubs and other things, but others of which should and could be met by creating these spaces on campus where students um, could, could go, but that weren't like what you might see in other districts of just like, um, like a more mental health facing center, this would be more of a space where students could gather and connect and get tutoring and get, um, and also receive mental health services that that is the area that they needed, but that that wasn't the only thing available in these centers. Mm -hmm. But this would be during class time, is that what I'm hearing? We always have to have a lot of parameters around these, and so this would be a next level of learning for us, would be typically, um, you know, if a student needs to have access to some, you know, to that it, there wouldn't be, like, you don't get to be out of your class for a whole period. That was something that was brought up um, by the committee. Um, but that it would be open during kind of free, um, like, lunchtime you know, on campuses or that, you know, if you don't have a, a class assigned during your flex period or your plus period, those kinds of things, but that there would need to be parameters put on it if you're supposed to be in your math class, you know. So those are some next steps. We don't have all of the answers identified yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of your work on this huge, huge lift. Appreciate it. I just wanted to add my thank you to that too, 
just sitting on one of those committees, I saw how much work went into just that. So I know this was so much to get done, and we really appreciate your hard work and the hard work of those who were coming along beside you. Okay, I appreciate the presentation. Seeing that it's an info item, uh, no direction needs to be given this evening, but thank you very much for that uh, extensive report uh, tonight. Now we'll move on to item 12.1, our public comment on non-agenda items. A few important reminders, this agenda item is to give anyone in attendance an opportunity to address the board in an open meeting concerning any non-agenda item within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. The board will not take action on any item not appearing on the posted agenda, but may refer the matter to a staff member for follow-up. A complaint about a specific employee of the district shall be made to that employee's immediate supervisor or the principal as required by Administrative Regulation 1312.1. To protect student privacy, please refrain from using student names or identifying characteristics. The board respects each individual's rights to express varied ideas and opinions and expect speakers to refrain from personal attacks based on protected categories under state and federal law, including race, religion, sexual orientation, disability, et cetera. Please be mindful that students may be watching. Please fill out a, couple, pub, a green public comment card, complete with all information, and turn it in prior to the agenda item being closed. I will call your name to invite you to the podium. We'll state who is on deck. When you approach the podium, Please restate your name, the city you live in, and the school your children attend. You will have two minutes to address the board. All comments must be respectful. Please, no profanity. Okay, we have just one non-agenda public comment this evening. Harley Larson. Uh, hello again, board. Harley Larson, Rockland Breen. Uh, just some thoughts on where our taxpayer money could be going. Uh, more than half of our elementary schools received a poor rating on their interiors last year. Broken ceiling tiles, cracked floor tiles, trip hazards, loose ramps, broken outlet covers, uh, just basic safety stuff. But maintenance costs money. For uh, Cal Ed Code, the district loses funding when class sizes are too big. It's hard to teach large classes as well. For grades four through eight, the guideline is the average number of students not to exceed 29.9 per classroom. Note that these numbers are averages, so some classes are larger. At Breen last year, fourth and sixth grade classes averaged 32 kids. Sierra Elementary averaged 31 kids in fifth. Antelope Creek averaged 32 in fourth and fifth. At Sunset Ranch, the average fifth grade class was 31 kids. I could go on, but we only get two minutes to speak. Last year's incoming kinder class was the biggest in the past several years. The tax bond that they reviewed earlier has text in it that says the conditions of overcrowding continue to exist in the district, but more teachers cost money. Rockland teacher salaries for all experience levels are lower than the California state average, while principal salaries are all higher than the state average. Beginning teacher salaries are $11,000 below state average at just under $45,000 a year. Rent for a one-bedroom apartment in Rockland is just under $2,000 a month. My oldest is in fourth grade, and she can do that math, thanks in no small part to our teachers here in Rockland, teachers who might be renting a one-bedroom apartment, teachers who we see trying to work with this board and being met with outright hostility at times. But teacher salaries cost money. All it takes to fix this is your vote in November, so I hope to see everyone voting. Thank you, Harley. Okay, we'll now move on to item 13.1, pending agenda items. Trustees, do you have any items to place on the pending agenda? No? Seeing none, the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>